Corey, why do you say writers should stop worrying about AI? Yeah. So if you are worried about AI, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to take a deep breath. I want you to do another favor. I want you to take another deep breath. So there's a lot of fear out there and there's, it's off the chart, the, the doom and gloom about AI. So first off, there is a tidal wave of litigation going through the courts that have some real teeth and that is going to have a big impact. And then there's the regulation, which the United States is behind on, but Europe is about three years ahead of us. And they're on the brink of passing some very, very substantial regulations and we will catch up. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a regulator, I'm not gonna to pretend to be an expert in that, but I talk to a lot of people who are experts in that and they all say, everyone needs to relax. It, it is not as scary or threatening as people think and there's gonna be a lot of protections in place. I wanna talk about it from the writing perspective because that's something I know a little bit about and I know that there's a lot of um, scary click links out there of you know AI is, gonna, AI is gonna replace writers, AI is gonna replace directors. So here's what I know. There's a category of writers uh, that I call conceptual writers, and they primarily work from the conceptual side of their brain, which has a perpendicular processor. So it's very analytic, it's very logical, and it's very smart. And these writers, when they write, their work is always very logical, and it has a lot of causality, like everything makes sense, everything causes something to happen, um, which is good, but it can feel a bit stale, predictable. There's not a lot of surprises, but it's very logical. It's very, um, a lot of causality and a lot of smart things are happening, interesting things happening in the script. But people aren't generally that interested when they read the script because there's no emotional connection from the conceptual side of the brain. And the characters feel like puppets who were created to serve the story. And these writers, 12 years ago could have careers, but today it's basically impossible because the industry's changed. People are tired of feeling afraid. People are tired of feeling uh, uh, disconnected and alienated and separate from others. People, everybody wants a human connection and an emotional connection. I recently, uh, just a few nights ago, uh, not too far from where we're taping this, I saw uh, the Coldplay concert. It was amazing, Selena was uh, performed, and there's really, really technically great AI produced music that almost no one listens to because when you listen to actual people singing, like there's, a, there's an emotional resonance in what they're singing, and you can feel that. And that's why we want to listen to music performed by human beings. Uh, a week ago, I saw Beth Orton, who's had a lot of pain in her life, and she sings from that pain, and she brings that pain and her joy into her music, and it's just, it's transcendent. It, it makes you feel connected to humanity, and it's the same thing with TV shows and movies. Uh, Netflix, during the, the writer strike that has ended, they spent enormous money to put a lot of reality TV um, as a way to mitigate their financial losses. It didn't work. They stopped it. it. It worked in the previous strike, which was 2008, because in the previous strike, most of the audience uh, were watching very formulaic, stale network TV shows. So if you're watching mediocre comfort food TV shows, reality TV isn't that much different. But it's completely different today. The modern audience has grown up watching Fleabag and Russian Doll and The Bear and I could go on and on. Uh, what people want, and studies have shown this, people want to feel something when they watch a TV show or movie. And they want to feel different than when they felt when they started to watch it. Otherwise, there's just too much stuff to do in, you know, there's too much other stuff you could be doing. People want to feel something. They want to feel a human connection. So AI right now, you could write a script with it. It's a joke. But I'm, I'm convinced that the next generation or generation after that, soon AI will catch up where it could write scripts. I predict that'll be about as good, maybe even as good as what a highly conceptual writer can write. Who cares? Nobody cares. It, AI is never going to be able to get right in a way that has emotional resonance. It will feel, just like music produced by artificial intelligence sounds different, music produced by Bruce Springsteen or, you know, uh, Nora Jones. It just feels different. 
Uh, one of my current students was one of the lead engineers on the first uh, MML program, and he, he adamantly agrees. It, it's never going to be able to write in a way that is going to make a genuine human connection. But if you're still worried, I want to share, I want to leave you with this. I want to share a true story. So I was in New York a couple months ago and I was uh, working with writers at NYU. And there was a writer, his name is Albert. And he said, ah, Corey, I have this dream to be a writer. I just don't know if I should put the time and energy in because I'm just too old and I, I missed my opportunity. And I said, Albert, do you mind? Can I ask you how old you are? And he said, just turned 40. And I went, oh. Have you heard of a little movie called uh, Spider-Man? He's like, yeah, obviously, Spider-Man, huge. And I go, do you know how old the writer was who wrote that? And he's like, let me guess, 40. And I said, nope, 72 years old. Have you seen The King's Speech? That was an unknown writer. He became a major A-list writer. He was 66 years old when he wrote it. I told him about a, a grandmother that I'd just recently been working with who sold, she was 64, just sold her first pilot, and it looks like it, hopefully, knock on wood, is going to go into production. Albert thought about that and he said, yeah, yeah, but I don't, I don't live in LA. I don't really want to live in LA. I like New York, so I don't know anyone in LA. So, so what's the point? And I said, Albert, that, that grandmother I told you about, you know where she lived? South Africa. The writer who wrote the King's Speech, where did he live? He lived in the UK. I started telling him about writers I've worked with who live in Bulgaria and Australia. Oh, there's a writer in Australia who, because I teach my workshops, uh, over Zoom on so people could take them all over the world. And so PETA, she, poor thing, she had to get up at like three in the morning to take the workshop. And she took the workshops. Anyway, she was in LA recently, well not recently, about a year ago, and I got to meet her for the first time. And the reason she was here, she was she won an Emmy. She came to get the Emmy. And so and Albert thought about that and he's like, yeah, yeah, but you know, I hear about this AI. I think it's gonna replace writers, so what's the point? And then I thought about it, like, do I wanna and then I realized, you know what? No, I mean, because if I explain the AI thing to Albert, I know what he was gonna say. I know he was gonna say, yeah, yeah, but, but what if everyone wakes up and all they want is opera and they stop watching TV shows and movies? So what's the point? Or what if an asteroid hits the earth and we're all gonna die, right? And it's like, ah, yeah, 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 the asteroid, you got me there, like that could happen. Here's the thing, Albert is just scared. He has a dream. And he's scared that if he puts in the work and goes for it, he could come up short. He could go for something he really wants and not make it. And he's scared. But he doesn't want to see himself as a coward. And he doesn't want to see himself as someone who's too scared to go after their dream. So he just needs an excuse. He needs some external excuse. So you have a choice. You can spend the next 10 years worrying Oh my God, AI might take away all the writing jobs. What's the point? Or you can do the work. Okay, what if someone says, well, automation took away factory jobs. It was supposed to help us, but instead it actually replaced a whole category of worker. And I'm afraid that even though I don't, I want to write the Joni Mitchell or the Bob Dylan of scripts, that some house music, no offense to people that like that, but is going to come along and change the industry. First of all, uh, it is tragic for the people and the communities that have been destroyed by automation. Um, but when you look at what jobs have been taken away from automation, they are physical manual jobs that do not require accessing or transferring human emotion. Um, it's, it's a completely different type of work. So will AI evolve and displace more workers and more industries? Probably. But it, if it ever got to the point where it could replace writers and actors, not being able to get a writing job or an acting job is going to be the least of your worries. I mean, the world as we know it is done. So that is my point, which is, yes, automation has destroyed livelihoods and communities. And we've, um, you know, I'll just say something on a personal note. Um, not that it really matters, but I'll just say it. I I've recently had a real awakening on this because I remember when I lived in San Francisco, I worked at the Federal Reserve Bank, and on the way to work, I'd always stop at this McNan, McNan Rally 
I can't pronounce it, I'm sorry, but it was a map. There was this guy and he owned a map. Rand, Rand McNally? Yes, thank okay. you, thank you. Right. Rand McNally. Uh, and it was like a franchise and he bought this franchise in San Francisco. And I, I did not enjoy being an economist. So I would stop there every day on the way to work and every day on the way back to work. And I would look at all the maps and stuff from all over the world just to pretend I was going to travel. Just just because I, I wanted to dream about doing something exciting. And the guy um, who owned it, uh, he would almost always be there and we would talk. And he was just a great guy. Okay, so cut to... I don't know, seven, eight years later, I'm in LA and I get my very first iPhone. And that's like magical, like, cause I'm always losing stuff. I don't like carrying things. I have an iPhone now and I don't have to carry around a flashlight. I don't have to carry around a recorder. I don't have to carry around so many things, including maps. It never occurred to me that the iPhone took away that gentleman's livelihood. It never occurred to me. It never occurred to me that there were people who made their living uh, working, making uh, recorders or, uh, or uh, magnifying glasses. Or I mean, I saw something that the iPhone basically destroyed 27 industries. And it never occurred to me because I was just in my world and I didn't know anyone who worked in those industries. And so I was like, the iPhone's great. Yeah, and then I remember the first time I saw one of those really scary clickbait, you know, headlines of, our writer's gonna be replaced by AI. I'm like, what? And I clicked on that and I read it and I got mad. I'm like, how can people allow this? How can they allow technology to come along and destroy people's livelihoods? You know, because it is my livelihood. <laughs> and it was a real awakening. It's like, I mean, I've always, I, I studied economics, I know, I can give you all the statistics about jobs lost, jobs gained, net this, net that, all of that. But there's a human aspect to it. This is really off topic, so um, feel free not to use this. But I just personally, um, and I know I'm not the only one. I have a lot of friends who's, I, I think that there's a, a, been a big awakening. And I walk the picket line a lot. And there's a lot of solidarity, I think, uh, amongst people of different walks of life and different socioeconomic realities and different jobs. And I think that's a good thing. I think, again, I think, I think that um, without taking a political side, I think a lot of government and a lot of big corporations purposely want to keep us divided and kind of pit us against each other to some extent to have some source of control. And I think that and then when COVID happened, it was like that on steroids. And I think that the world is changing. And I think more and more people are realizing, you like it or not, we're all in this together. And so I know I'm not answering your question, but I just wanted to share that. But again, to your question, yes, automation has replaced jobs. I think in the current marketplace, writers and actors are very safe from that for now. No one can predict the future. So that's, again, I, I will return to this point. You have a choice. You could worry about it. And you could use that as an excuse. You know what? You could hit by a car tomorrow. So what's the point? You can use that as an excuse. Or you can have the courage to get up and work your rear end off and work to achieve your dreams. And the people that do that have a real shot at being able to live the life they want. And the rest of the people can sit around complaining till the cows come home. What were the conversations you were having with the writers during the strike? Whew. I mean, there was a lot of darkness and fear. I mean, it was a, it was a long strike and it, it didn't look good in the beginning. L let's give a little bit of a perspective. So. When there's a war, the generals will look at the last war to see what worked and they'll replicate that. And usually that's a good idea. Sometimes that's how empires fall. So in 2008, which was the last serious work stoppage that the writers did, the writer's strike, um, at that point, reality TV was starting to grow in popularity. And so the whole thing about a strike, and I'm sure you know most of uh, you listening to know this, so what happens is when there's a strike, it will not resolve until both sides want it to resolve. So both sides have to be in enough pain that they're like, let's 
figure out a solution. If one side wants a solution and one is like, let's keep the strike going, it's gonna keep going. Okay, so what happened is in 2008, the, the networks, the powers that be said, well, we can't get any scripted you know, content, so let's just triple down on reality TV and hopefully we'll get similar ratings. Well, it was better than that for them. They got almost identical ratings and it's a lot cheaper to do reality TV. So suddenly they were like, you know what? We like this strike. So the writers in 2008 were really struggling, um, you know, and I was making my living as a writer back then. So it's really hard when you can't, you know, get a paycheck. And so we're like, hey, y'all, let, let's talk. And they're like, nah, we're good. You, you, you keep picketing. Like, you, you go for it, you spunky writers. We're just gonna do reality TV. And it, it got to the point where we had such little leverage. You know, our, our guild's amazing and they got the best deal they could, but it was a bad deal because we didn't have the leverage. Okay, so when the two, uh, 2023 strike happens, uh, the networks are like, well, let's pull out the old playbook. And the head of Netflix pretty uh, arrogantly, I could use a different word, but I won't, uh, arrogantly said, ah, we're just gonna triple down on reality TV. And then of course, the thing that saved us was the actors. If the actors hadn't gone on strike and the producers were desperately trying to peel them off and, and get them to a deal, because without them, we would have been left out in the cold. So that was a huge turning point. So the actors go on strike. We haven't struck together, the writers and the actors, like in 60 years, this is a big deal. But the powers that be, and I'm just gonna use Netflix as the example because they are the evil Death Star in this story. Netflix is like, we're just gonna do reality TV. We're just gonna do foreign. Um, now Netflix has all the data in the world. They know more about us than we know. And after a month, they abruptly stop spending that money. They cut the cord. Why? Because they know or they knew it wasn't working. Why wasn't it working? In 2008, most of the audience had been watching network TV. Network TV got really bad in the 90s and in, into the 2000s. There were a few good shows, but most of it was just the same old formulaic junk. And if that's what you've been watching, Reality TV, in some ways, was a step up because in 2008, reality TV was still early, so it was not, you know, it was novel and unique, and there was some interesting reality TV shows, and the audience was pretty much like, yeah, we'll, we'll do this. Well, what happens in 2023? I mean, an entire generation now of the viewers, they've grown up, ironically, because of Netflix. Netflix has spent 17 billion dollars a year for the past five years. Everyone's racing to catch up. There's been so much money. Yeah, a lot of junk has been made, but some amazing stuff has been made. Amazing content like Fleabag and Breaking Bad and Russian Doll and The Bear, and I can go on and on and on. Okay, so an audience that's watching that, when you suddenly say, hey, pay for your subscription, and here's what we're gonna give you. More reality TV, you're gonna be able to watch the Housewives of South Dakota or whatever. I mean, you're just gonna get more reality TV than you can stand. This is gonna be awesome, right? And they're like, no, thank you. And people canceled their Netflix subscriptions and canceled their Hulu subscriptions and they stopped watching and they tuned out. And that terrified the industry because if they tune out, where are they going? And maybe where they're going, they're gonna wanna stay there. So suddenly, everything changed and it went from we, we came out of the darkness of the strike of this is going to go on forever we're probably going to get a bad deal this is horrible and there was a lot of economic pain out there and suddenly we came into the light because suddenly they're like hey let's get this done like let's get a deal done and we're like great here's our terms and they're like okay but we've got to negotiate no no these are our terms and it's even better than that and the reason it's even better than that is I think that, because we were on the picket line with the actors and we had real solidarity and we've realized something. We realized we don't need the suits. We don't need Netflix. What is Netflix? It is an online blockbuster video. It's just housing content, TV shows, movies. We don't care about Netflix. We care about the TV shows and the movies. Now, anyone who's watching this who's on the younger side, 
you might want to Google Blockbuster Video. Blockbuster Video was an 800 pound corporate entity that was just minting profit. And then someone came along and destroyed them. And that someone was called Netflix. Netflix came in and said, there's no more monopoly, there's no more monopoly on distribution. Anyone can make stuff and show it uh, via these platforms. And suddenly the TV industry doesn't have a monopoly, the studios don't have a monopoly, uh, Blockbuster Video doesn't, it disrupted everything. Okay. But then Netflix, of course, invited all of this competition. And suddenly now the reality is, why do we even need Netflix? In fact, why do we need the studios? So here's something that just happened and you're gonna see a lot more of this. Taylor Swift has a movie and she decided, I'm not going to the studios to distribute my movie because why would I? I don't need them. She just went to the theaters and said, you want really good content, right? People seem to like me right now. I have a movie. You want to negotiate? And they're like, yeah, who's the distributor? And she's like, me. And she just cut the studios completely out. Now, we don't have right now that, you know, we don't have the social media pull or, you know, we don't have the social uh, tension that Taylor Swift does. Okay, so she was the first to do this. But there were so many conversations with writers on, this, on the, um, the picket line. And you're going to see this. Back in the day, a bunch of uh, actors and directors created their own artist-friendly company called United Artists. This is like back in the, what, 40s or 50s, 1940s or 50s. What's gonna happen is they're gonna be showrunners, big writers, big actors. They're gonna get together and say, let's create our own platform. It's not that expensive and we can easily raise the money and we'll have an artist-friendly platform that treats artists the right way and we will get all our friends, showrunners and actors and directors, to exclusively make content for us. Like, we don't need Netflix. Like, again, anyone could create a online uh, streaming platform. It's not, I mean, it's not that hard to do anymore. What matters is the TV shows and the movies, it's the entertainment, it's the content. That's what matters. Well, who controls that? We do. The actors do. The writers do. The directors do. We control that. The studios are going to look back at this strike and say it was the worst thing that ever happened to them because I was a working writer for 12 years and I can tell you the way the game is played is they always had control and they used scarcity of jobs to their advantage and they pitted us against each other. I always felt, I mean, I, had, I have and had friends as writers, but for the most part, I often saw other writers as competition. They wanted that. They wanted us to be competing against each other and they had complete control because if you, want, if you had a movie or a TV show, you needed them to show it to the world. We don't need that anymore. And being on the picket line together, suffering together, we realize we're artists. We are, you're my sister, you're my brother. Man, that solidarity is not going away. I mean, the writers are like, we're not going back to work until you, settle. we're not crossing the actress picket line. They supported us, we're supporting them. We're on a team. And you know what? We're the team that makes the world go around. We're the ones that make everything that people want to watch. I'm telling you, the, the, the studios blew it. They thought they could crush us. And what they did is they woke up a sleeping giant. And we realize now that we don't really need them. Okay, so then if there was, let's say, this uh, you know, actor sort of filmmaker alliance that, that comes together and forms its own sort of unofficial studio, democratized studio, Eventually, though, don't you think then a hierarchy is going to form and then rules and then, you know, it, it could become the same situation where you have people at the top dictating and pulling all the shots. So well, were... here's, I, it's a great question. Here's what I would say. Um, uh, can, can, I, can I tell you a true story that will lead into my point? Sure. Okay. There's a lot of stories out there about uh, how terrible Hollywood is and how they treat people horribly. I was a working writer for nine years. I have the scars to prove it. 
And um, I could tell you some really terrible stories, but I'm not going to. I want to tell you a really great story. I was a young writer and there was a project at Paramount. This is back when Sherry Lansing was running Paramount. And they had this project they were interested in, but they could never figure out how to do it. They couldn't figure out a take. And there was, they kind of had it in the back pile. And there was a young executive who really loved this project and he was a young executive, so he couldn't work on the prestigious stuff. And he's like, can I champion this project? And so Sherry said, yes, and I'll give you a budget of $100,000, which means he could hire a writer for up to $100,000. So he wasn't gonna get an experienced writer, he wasn't gonna get a big writer, so, you know, he wasn't gonna get Aaron Sorkin or any one of that ilk. So he needed to get a newer writer. So it becomes an open assignment and agencies can say, hey, I got the perfect person, here they are, read their script, and I was one of those people. And the producers, this is important, it's Trilogy, it was, they were producers, and it was called Trilogy Entertainment. I think they're still around. And um, so they brought me in and I did my pitch, and it just really landed. The executive was like, oh my God, this is like even better than we realized, this is really cool, I can't wait to tell Sherry. So at their next meeting, when they were around the room, he's like, hey, I've got a, I heard a really great take for that project. She's like, okay, let me hear it. And he, he did, you know, the summary of the take, and Sherry got really excited, and she's like, now this is gonna be a big summer movie. All right, I'll give you a million dollars, go get a real writer. Now, you're the producers. Who do you want writing the script? A, a guy right out of film school, no real credits, unproven, or a million dollar writer. I mean, you get Aaron Sorkin or you know a big name writer to write the script, suddenly it has cachet. Suddenly stars and directors. Like obviously you want the million dollar writer. So that basically meant I was gonna get you know what over. I mean, I came up with the take and now that they realized this opportunity, they were gonna just hire a million dollar writer to write it and I get nothing. And this kind of thing does happen. Except Trilogy said to Sherry, well, wait a minute, Corey came up with the take. You now wanna spend a million dollars. We got a problem, but we've, we've come up with a solution. Pay Corey a million dollars and you have a million dollar writer. I wish the punchline was she said yes. No, she did not say yes. Um, and they went around in circles and she says, no, I've got a list of writers. And they said, well, look, we're the producers. Corey came up with the take. He deserves the first crack. You're gonna pay him and he's gonna write it. And if he nails it, we're gonna make it. And if he doesn't, then you can go get your writer. But we're sticking by our guy. Now, is this in their interest? Not at all. Why did they do it? They started out as writers. These were writers who became producers. I've worked for production companies where the people in charge were writers and it is a different experience when the people in charge went to MBA schools or suits. So these new writer collectives, these artist friendly, they're going to be created by writers and actors for writers and actors and they're going to create a set of rules that are artist friendly. And it's, it's not only morally right, it's going to be very smart business because the best writers and the best actors are going to want to come and do content and do projects. I mean, during the strike, there were major movie stars. There were right, major showrunners who like have literally hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank. This strike isn't affecting them at all and they weren't out in their Italian uh, vacation homes. You know what they were doing? In a very hot summer, they were walking the picket lines. And they weren't doing it for publicity, they weren't doing it to be noticed, they were doing it in solidarity because they were a starving writer, they were a middle level writer or actor, they understand. So I really believe that these new entities that are formed, they're going to treat writers and actors the right way. It's not gonna be about creating as much profit for shareholders. It's going to be, I, I predict that they will take a certain portion of the profits and reinvest it into new projects with new emerging talent. Oh, I think it's gonna be wonderful. So here's the difference between a writer and a creator. 
A writer is always chasing a paycheck. They're always looking for a job. They're always looking for someone to hire them and pay them to write. I was a writer, and so here's just an example. The uh, movie studios will hire writers because they've bought some source material, maybe the rights to remake something, maybe they bought a graphic novel, they need to hire someone to write that script. Or they have an original idea, need to hire someone to write that script. Or they have a script that someone wrote and they, it needs work and they need someone to rewrite it. So these are called feature writing assignments. And that's what I did for, uh, I did 19 of them. And basically what happens is they let the industry know we're looking for a writer at this budget range for this and the agents and managers, I got the perfect person, read this sample, meet with this person and they make a list and they meet with people one on one and you pitch, you pitch your heart out. You're like, here's what I would do, here's how to make this great and, and they, they can, they'll hire someone. And that's what I did for a living. So I'd get paid, it was nice money, I'd write the project and then when I was done, it was go out and audition for another job and that was my life, always being a writer, always chasing a paycheck. Uh, I, I train a lot of TV writers and obviously for TV writers, they are staff writers. You know, the TV shows have rooms of writers and you get hired and you get a contract and you work for the year and you get paid and you get benefits and then when the year's over, you very much hope the show brings you back. And if they don't, then you gotta scramble and try to find another show. That's a writer. A writer is always chasing a paycheck, not a creator. A creator is not chasing a paycheck. They're not looking for someone to validate them and say, okay, I'll pay you. A creator is creating their future. They are not chasing jobs. What a creator is doing is they're creating the life that they want. I'll give you some examples. Absolute true story. There's two writers, Rob and Sharon, and they moved to LA. Now, when you come to LA and you don't have an agent, you don't have a manager, you don't have credits, it's hard to get people to notice you. It's hard to get people to read your scripts. It can be done. You gotta know how to play the game. You have to be uh, very dedicated. You have to be relentless. It's gonna take some real time and energy. You gotta climb that mountain. Everyone has to do it. It can be done if you know the right way to do it, but it's gonna take time and energy. Rob and Sharon met each other online on Twitter and they became friends and then they started collaborating and then they became writing partners. And they both also were actors. So at some point they're like, well, we could put a lot of time and energy to try to get representation and chase writing job or we could just create our future. And what, what, what we wanna do is write a show like this and maybe even be in it. So now that's not easy. That, that, there's a lot of things you have to do to make that happen. I'll talk about it in a little bit. But that's what they did because they figured it's pretty much the same mountain. It's just a different mountain, but it, it's, it's going to take time and energy, but so is the other option. And their show sold and it got made and it was called Catastrophe. And they are the stars of the show and they created their entire career. They created it. They weren't looking for someone to pay them. If you're a writer, you're paid to serve someone else's creative vision. If you're a creator, you get to pay writers to serve your vision. So I worked with a writer, uh, her name is Jacqueline, and she had a manager and she actually had been staffed on some shows, but it was like she'd be staffed one year, two years she wasn't, then she was, then she wasn't. So it was like, I have a paycheck, I don't have a paycheck, I have a paycheck, I don't have a paycheck. Living off savings, sometimes have to supplement it with work. It's stressful, you're, you're always stressed about what is gonna happen in three months. And she heard me speak and she goes, will you work with me? Because I want to be a creator. I don't want to be a writer. So I read her work. I, I knew she had a lot of potential. I'm like, okay, so what are we going to create? And Jacqueline's like, well, what, what should I? Like, what, is, what are they looking for? What could I sell? And it's like, whoa, 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 Jacqueline. That's the writer's mindset. That's the, what does mommy and daddy want? What does the industry want? Uh, what do I need to do to make the industry happy? That's not a creator mindset. The creator mindset is, what do you want to create? What do you most want to create? What is so unique and inside you that you're willing to work tirelessly to create? So she comes back, she goes, I got these three ideas. Which one do you think has the best chance? Whoa, 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 Jacqueline. That's the writer's mindset. The creator's mindset is which one of these three 
means the most to you? She goes, well, this one. I'm like, why? And now the work begins. Why do you love this so much? Why do you love these characters so much? What, why is this so deeply important to you? Okay, so this is what you're going to put your effort in. This is now your dream. This is now the direction you're marching. Now comes the stuff you have to learn. Like you have to learn how to heighten the concept. I learned that very early on. Um, I was a, uh, a, a studio reader, a gatekeeper. And my job was to read scripts. And then if I thought a script was phenomenal, to tell my boss, hey, I think you should read this. So I would, I'd go to, I didn't do it very often. I'm like, hey, this script's amazing. Like, what's the concept? And I had like a minute at most to pitch it. So I'd pitch it and they're like, nah, Pasadena. That was his way of saying passing. And I'm like, but the script is, he's like, I don't care. The concept isn't. And so it was really helpful for me. I didn't have a career at the time, but I realized, okay, until you're an established writer, you have to heighten a concept. You have to take your concept and you have to be able to heighten it where when someone tells a decision maker in 30 seconds the concept, they'll be like, yeah, I wanna read that. So I helped Jacqueline with that. I helped her with story engines. You need to have a story engine to sell anything because no one buys a pilot script, they wanna buy a show. And you need, without a, a, a long form story engine, you can't sell anything. Used to be easier, because everything was episodic in network TV where it was like each week was just a standalone episode. So it was episodic engines. But now everything's long form storytelling. So it's like a movie told over 10 or 20 episodes. So you had to teach her how to do an engine, how to teach her some other uh, things like proof of concept. And then we had to work on the pitch. That was so important because in this marketplace, you want to be a creator, you write the pilot, but you pitch the show. And, and people don't spend enough time on the pitch. So she spent four months working with me and also working with a uh, showrunner friend. And she had an amazing pitch. She had an amazing script. And I also had her do a lookbook. And a lookbook, it was like a 25 uh, page book that just visually showed you what this could be and really made you in an immersive way feel like this was a show. Now that's a lot of work. I mean, all in it was a year. It was a lot of work, but she's not chasing a job. She wants to be a creator. And so it went out and oh, I should say that um, her role model was Catastrophe. That's why I brought Catastrophe up. And her project had a similar tone and a similar energy, but a very different concept. Well, Sharon has a production company. That's what happens when you are a creator. You create a production company. Sharon, who was the writer and uh, actor in Catastrophe, she read this and loved it and said, I want to produce this. This is like something I would have written 20 years ago. Jacqueline's probably about 20 years younger than her. And then it went out and it sold. And um, before the strike, it was going to go into production. So hopefully it will go into production. That's what a creator does. I'll give you another example. Leslie and Simon came to LA. They didn't know anyone, didn't have representation. Started looking around, realized how the game is played. And it's like, okay, this is what you got to do to get people to notice you and get meetings. It's going to take a long time, take a lot of energy, can be done. Why don't we just spend the time and energy being creators and finding what we want to do and owning it and developing it and getting the world excited by our vision. Two years later, they wrote an Academy Award winning film, All Quiet on the Western Front. Now, I've become really good friends with them. They're awesome people. So writers chase the opportunities. The opportunities chase creators. So Leslie and Simon now are putting together a production company. They're not going around auditioning for jobs. They're having dinner with stars, major directors, heads of studios, heads of networks. Yeah, you write an Academy Award winning film, that's what happens. It completely changes your life. And I just want to share something personal. So I don't come from money. Um, my parents cut me off, so I, I had no safety net. I was living off Top Ramen and, and uh, student loans. And I started working and I was a writer. I was chasing the paychecks. And I had fear. I, I kept chasing more and more jobs because I didn't want the paychecks to end. And I had multiple agents and managers say, hey, you got enough money in the bank. Take a year off and be a creator. Take your shot. 
I mean, yeah, being a paid writer is cool, but it isn't. Here's the thing, like, why do you want to be a writer? And I would ask someone this, why do you want to be a writer? Is it you want to share your stories and your characters with the world? You want to be a creator. Do you want creative freedom? You want to be a creator. If you're in it for the money, you don't have to be ashamed of that. If money matters, it mattered to me. You want to be a creator. Uh, as a writer, I was able eventually to buy a home in LA. That's not easy to do. I have friends who are creators. They have, they just bought their seventh vacation home and I'm not exaggerating. I, I have uh, friends who are creators. They have three different vacation homes in Italy. I don't know why they need that, but they have three, I mean, so, you want to be a creator and not a writer. But I was scared. I was like, I could spend a year and I could write this thing from my heart and I could just do the thing I most want and it could be rejected. And that, 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 was, that just felt painful. And I'm like, no, just, just get me a job and just get me a paycheck. Also, I think partly I, I grew up in a very blue collar household. My mom worked retail, my dad, I mean, they, they I love my parents and, um, and I never went to bed hungry and they paid for my undergraduate and I, so I know I was much more fortunate than a lot of people, but they worked for a job. They, they, they didn't have wealth, they didn't have investments, they don't come from money, they, they came from nothing. And they just worked every day for their paycheck. And I had that mentality. And, um, and I, I look back and I really regret this because like seeing Leslie and Simon's life, it's like, what if I had taken a year off and tried that? Would I have succeeded? Maybe, maybe not. But at least I would have tried. I never tried. I was just always chasing a paycheck. So you have a choice to make, especially if you're newer on your writing journey, you're coming into the game at the best time ever, there's going to be uh, less writing jobs. Um, I know it doesn't sound like the best thing ever, I'll finish my thought, but without going into details, Netflix and Amazon just had obscene amounts of money funneled to them from Wall Street to just make everything. That's not gonna happen anymore. They're gonna be spending less money. There's still gonna be a lot of money spent. There's still gonna be a lot of writing jobs out there, but there won't be as many. And you should prepare yourself for that because you're going to hear a lot of stories about people who are like, it's impossible. I had a writing job and now I can't, you know, the B plus writers were working and now they probably won't be working. So just, you're going to hear a lot of doom and gloom. So it's going to get a little harder to keep getting that writing paycheck. Very doable, but it's going to be easier to be a creator because there is now going to be more and more outlets for you and opportunities and resources and support. So you have a choice. Nothing is going to be easy in this life and nothing's going to be easy in the entertainment world. It's very competitive. You're going to have to pour heart and soul, suffer through a lot of rejection, and you have to just keep getting back on your feet and you're going to have to keep marching forward. But the question is, what are you marching toward? What is your dream? Your dream is what you navigate toward. You can, you, is your dream to just keep getting paid and have someone pay you as a writer? No shame if that's your dream, but at least consider the alternative. Right. Can I interject you for a moment? You please. Um, what if someone doesn't have the temperament though to be a creator? I, I love what you're saying and I love the stories that you yep. use, um, but what if they don't have the discipline, they can't even show up for themselves every day, but they have this great story idea? And then B, so that's A, and then B, the money that it would take to create something or to sustain someone while they're trying to create something. Yeah, great question. So let's start with the second. So someone wants to be a writer and let's say there's two people and one person's like, I want to be a writer, I want to get representation and I want to get start getting writing paychecks. And this person's like, not me, I want to be a creator. Okay, it's going to take both these people a period of time before either of them see any money. So both these people are gonna to have to find a way to sustain themselves. So that's, that's just part of the game. And, and everyone goes through that. I remember working with a writer and um, she's like, I, she was working as a reader and she was working for a producer 
because she was making connections and learning stuff and she was making money to live, but she had no energy to write. And she decided, what's my dream? What's my dream is to be a creator. So I need to make a living in a way that gives me the time and energy to create. So she quit. She moved back to her hometown. I think it was Lansing, Michigan, where it was a lot uh, cheaper cost of living. And she worked uh, as a, she got a manager training program and became a manager at The Gap. And the reason is she said, I stood around and I folded and fluffed clothing. And doing that, I, I could work in my head and write. And when I came home, I was charged to work. And I did that for a year and I did my best writing. Now, I, I lived a very modest lifestyle. I was in, no, no offense to Lansing, Michigan, but her friends were in LA now. She wanted to be in LA. That's the choice she made. So, but my point is the question of how do you support yourself until you can start to make money exists either way if you want to be a writer or a creator. So that's no difference. And I'll answer the, the first part, which is what if someone doesn't have the, men, um, the temperament? What if someone doesn't have the discipline and can't be self-sufficient and show up for themselves? Well, I would say that that person will not make it as a creator and they won't make it as a writer. It doesn't matter. That you, you, you need that for both. And if you don't have that, you got two choices. Get another dream or learn to do that. These are skills that you can train yourself in. Don't, you know, it, we can change. And if we want something bad enough, but I would just candidly and bluntly say, if someone is not resourceful, thick-skinned, hardworking, I mean hardworking, uh, willing to put the time in, and uh, will work for themselves and, and are self-accountable, if they don't have that, they're not gonna make it as a writer or a creator. And just curious, why thick-skinned? I liked all the other things. Oh, well, where why thick-skinned? Where does being thick-skinned come in? So this is personal to me because, um, you know, I, I've, I was a writer for 10 years, that's how I made my living. I, I did teach occasionally at UCLA Film School, but I was a writer. And then for a variety of reasons, I went from being a writer very excitedly to be someone who works with writers and helps writers. And I've been doing that for the last 10 years. And being on this side of the table, it's so clear to me that all writers have strengths and weaknesses and blind spots. Blind spots are weaknesses they don't know they have. I had a blind spot. Uh, I eventually realized what it was, but it was kind of late into the game and I didn't know what to do about it. This was my blind spot. So let me step back and talk about some of my strengths. You know, I was incredibly hardworking. Uh, you know, if I put my mind to something, I'll, I will just keep going till I die or succeed. I never quit. Um, I think I'm really good at picking things up and, and finding the people that can help me and not being and not being so full of myself that I don't listen. And I think I take notes really well. I had some writing ability, so all that's great. But my biggest blind spot was resilience, which I did not have. And I would define resilience the following way. When things are going your way and you're getting good news and the writing's flowing, it's easy to show up every day and be at your best. But when you get punched in the face, when you get bad news, when you get kicked in the gut, and man, that's kind of, you know, the industry is like a roller coaster. I'd show up, because I was, but I was not at my best. I, I was writing um, from fear, I, I was reactive, I wasn't centered. I wasn't my best me, it wasn't my best writing. And of course this goes beyond writing, I, you know, um, you know, my relationship, you know, with my wife, when everything's going great, I'm a great husband. When I get kicked in the gut by life, I, I can sort of go into a shell and be a little uh, edgy and not always so present. I've gotten a lot better at it in my older age, but as a writer, I put the time in, but I wasn't resilient. What resilience is, no matter what's happening to you, you show up and you work at your best. 
Um, you know, I, I'm into like sports and like when you look at the, the, the best, you know, like Steph Curry or Michael Jordan in basketball, um, that's what they have in spades. They have the ability that no matter what's going on in their career or the game, they always play at their best. They are resilient. Um, if you rank resilience on a scale of one to 10, I was a very low number. And that, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I had a career in spite of that. I would have had a much better career if I could have dealt with it. I didn't realize it till late in the game, and then when I did realize it, I didn't know what to do about it. You know, I, I read books, I talked to people, I, I didn't know how to become more resilient until I stopped writing, then I could do it. Um, so that's why I'm saying thick skin. That was sort of my proxy for um, it doesn't mean that you don't feel pain. It doesn't mean that when you get bad news or something unfair happens that you don't go, oh, that hurts. Uh, or if you get terrible news about someone you love, something bad has happened to them. It's not like it doesn't affect you. It affects you. But when you show up to the keyboard, you are writing to the best of your ability. That's resilience. And the, the best writers who consistently write to the best of their ability have the best careers. Why is it nearly impossible to get an agent or manager, yeah. and what can you do about it? Great questions. Yeah, that, I mean, everyone has that, which is, is it impossible to launch a career without an agent or manager? No, but it's a lot easier if you have one. Case in point, uh, I was 23 years old in film school, and I launched my career by selling a pitch to Ridley Scott, and it was in the front page of Variety and The Hollywood Reporter, and that's a nice way to, because he said he was gonna make the film, and he spoke about the script in a very positive way. Now, how did I get that meeting to go pitch to Ridley Scott? I can't call Ridley Scott's company and say, hey, I'm in film school, you don't know me, but I think you'll like my pitch, hello, hello? <laughs> so I got signed by Diane Cairns, a major agent at ICM. Uh, several years before that, she had found a new writer and championed that writer, and, uh, and brought that writer into Ridley Scott's company and they bought that writer's project. Her name was Callie Corey, the project was Thelma and Louise. Ridley made that movie and won the Academy Award. So a few years later when Diane calls and says, hey, I got the next Callie Corey. I got this young writer you never heard of. You gotta read his writing, you gotta meet with him. Of course they're gonna be like, yeah, send the script right over, read it tonight, I mean, let's set up a meeting. Of course they're gonna do that. Because, you know, I have credibility because of Diane's credibility. So not impossible to launch a career without an agent or manager, agent or manager, but it's gonna be a lot easier. Which of course is why people say, it's impossible to get an agent or a manager. So here's what I wanna do. I want to um, give people an insider's look at what's going on and what you're up against and what you need to do about it. So I was a, a industry gatekeeper for a studio and also for a management company. So. If you get your script to an agency or management company, the agent or manager isn't gonna read your script. Someone like myself at the time is gonna read it and put the scripts into piles and determine which ones go to the agent or manager. Uh, I recently in a UCLA class had three management uh, gatekeepers, executives come and ask them what their process was. They all had the same process, different companies, and it was cool, it's the same process that I was taught 18, 20 years ago. So it, it hasn't changed and it's not gonna change. Here's the process, here's an inside look. Okay, step one. If your job is to read scripts and determine which script goes home or which scripts go home with the agent or manager over the weekend, the first thing you're taught is pull out all the scripts that are written to a paradigm, a formula, you know, the rules, they're called film school scripts. Pull those scripts out and put them here in the trash can they cannot go on to the desk or you lose your job. You used to have to write that way to get a job back when the only game in town was writing for the networks and they were all formulaic. That all changed 10 years ago and now any agent or manager will tell you to stand out and get noticed, you have to write something unique and something powerful. Even if you end up getting your first writing job on a Netflix or network show that's highly formulaic, it doesn't matter. If you wrote a formulaic script, I can't get anyone to pay attention to it. Okay, so the first thing is all the formula and rules and paradigms to the popular books, classes, whatever, they get there. Okay, 
So now the pile's been reduced somewhat. Now what? Now you go through these scripts and you read the first scene or two and you stop. And you say, do I have to keep reading? And if the answer is no, into the trash. So you've taken a pile and you've gone it down to a much smaller pile. Now you take these scripts and you're going to divide them into three piles on the desk on Friday afternoon. Now these scripts are not formulaic. They're not paradigm driven. There's something unique and powerful in the writing. These are like, you know, the, the A scripts, you know, these are the, the best of the best. Okay, so the first pile is, wow, great concept, great story. Characters aren't super strong, but the story and the concept, and we'll call this the story pile. You can guess what the next one is. We call it the voice pile. Great characters, great dialogue, great uh, texture, emotional texture. Just the writer's got such a great voice. Story's not the best, but man, that voice. That's the voice pile. Then there's the final third pile. We call this the needle pile. The needle in the haystack that everyone's looking for. It's the script that does both. And this is what happened when I was the executive doing this and what, this is what these three executives said. So the manager would come on a Friday and they would pick up the needle scripts, the both scripts, dump that in their bag, and then they'd pick up scripts from the voice or the story, and they sort of leaf through it and ask me some questions. They're like, oh, that sounds interesting. Oh, yeah. I'm really busy this weekend, though, so I should just stick with these scripts. And that happened every Friday. I was there for 13 months. They never read any of these scripts because they're always really busy. So they only read those scripts, the scripts that do both amazing characters and amazing story. And a lot of those writers, or not, maybe not a lot, but a good number of those writers they'd sign. And when I was there, every writer they signed got a career. And my manager is really cool. If there was a script that they didn't sign the writer for whatever reason, they'd say, hey, if you want to show this with the writer's permission, I don't care if you show the script to other people, we're not going to work with them. They're an amazing writer. I'd ask the writer, can I show your script to my friends at other management agencies? They're like, yes, please do. And I, I, not all of them, but a fair amount of them got reps somewhere else, and a lot of them got careers. I always ask agents and managers, like, cause, like everyone's like, oh, it's so hard to have a career. But you're listening to the people who don't have careers. It's like, you know, like if your doctor prescribes a medication or you're thinking about a product and you go on and you look online, you're going to always pretty much see, this is terrible, this is horrible. Because the people that love it, they're not, <laughs> they're just enjoying the product. They're not online saying this is great. It's the people who had an issue. And it's the same thing with, it's impossible to get, because those are the people who don't have careers. So agents and managers will say, you know, what, what are your chances of success? It depends what pile you're in. If you are a formulaic rule-based writer, 0%. If you're a great story, not so great character, not a 2% chance. It can happen. You gotta be prolific, you gotta get lucky, about 2%. I know 2% doesn't sound like a lot. It's a lot more than 0%. What about the voice? Now you're probably with about 5%. Because there are showrunners who have a staff of writers and they'll have a couple of writers who are amazing with character and dialogue, not so good at story because there's other people that can do the story. So about a 5% chance. Again, 5% doesn't sound like a lot. It's a talk to the person with a 0% chance. The needle writers. I don't know a single writer who can do that who doesn't have a career. I can't say it's 100%. Nothing's guaranteed in life. But when I ask agents or managers, they're like, probably about 80%. That's a pretty good number. So if you ever hear someone say, you know, it's impossible, or if you ever wonder, what are my chances of success? Well, it could be 0%, it could be 2%, it could be 5%, it could be 80%. The reason it's so hard to get an agent or manager is it's so hard to do both. And there's a reason for that. And there is something you can do to dramatically increase your chances. And it's called creative integration. And so I don't waste your time talking about this right now. I've done a video for Film Courage on creative integration. Look it up. And uh, I, if you're serious about writing or just casually interested, 
it's worth the 20 minutes. You need to understand creative integration. When you're done, if you want to jump to my website, coreymandel.net, there's some more free information there. But start with the Film Courage uh, video and watch that video on creative integration because it is absolutely the secret sauce why so many of the writers that I've trained have careers. We now have over 3,000 of the writers that we've trained have feature film or TV writing careers. And every single one of them will say, Creative integration was the game changer. So check it out. You have a free story structure training course on your website? Uh, no, I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to do it for exclusively Film Courage uh, viewers because here's something I know about you. You're really smart. Now, how do I know that? You're watching Film Courage. So um, yeah, I, I talk at a lot of places like Film Courage and I try to give information that I hope people find helpful, but you know, what's always frustrating for me is I can't really get into the secret sauce of what I teach writers because they pay money for it and I don't think it would be fair. But I'm going to give you one piece right now for free because I know money's tight for a lot of people and not everyone can afford to take a class or, or do an on-demand digital product. But I also will make a special offer for you uh, at the end of this. So watch this video because I will give you a way that you could try out the full suite of modern story tools absolutely risk-free, which I've never done before. All Everything I do is always, all sales are final. You can't get your money back. I'm gonna make an exception for the first two weeks after this video drops. Okay, but first let me give you the free thing. So in my workshops, and also for people that since like six to nine months out to take the workshops, I have on-demand content. I have a brand new thing called the Modern Story Tools, and it teaches the five tools required to have success in the current marketplace. Compelling conflict, targeted escalations, relentless pursuit, intriguing question tool, and deep heart of darkness. I wanna talk about compelling conflict. Um, you might have heard me say this before, but as a former studio and manager reader, we're trained, if a script is submitted, to read the first scene or two and stop. And if we don't have to keep reading, we don't. And if it's not written in compelling conflict, really good chance we're not gonna keep reading. And I've trained a lot of writers who like, you know, they do well in the major uh, competitions like Austin and stuff, but then once they learn conflict and put it in there, then they start winning the competitions and they get managers. So compelling conflict is so important and there's seven pieces that you have to be doing. I'm gonna give you one of the pieces right now. And even if you don't check out the videos or study with me. Just this one piece, if you incorporate it into your writing, I'm confident it will make a difference. Your writing will improve. So I will give you one piece absolutely free. And that way, if you're like, oh, this is cool, I'd like to learn more, there's a risk-free way of doing it. Okay, so here's the one piece that I'll give you. And I'm gonna do it, uh, I'm gonna tell you a, a story. I want you to imagine that we are in a classroom at UCLA. So you're in a classroom with me and I'm teaching and I get a phone call and I get this terrible news that my brother's been in this really bad accident and he's in the emergency room at the UCLA hospital at the base of campus and they have to operate in 20 minutes or he'll die. He has a rare blood type, they're out of that blood type, but he has a medical emergency bracelet that says, contact my brother Corey, he has my blood type. So Corey, you gotta get here in 20 minutes or your brother's gonna die. Okay, that's Pretty meaningful stakes. And let's say in this scene, my goal is I gotta leave the classroom like in the next 20 seconds so I can get to my car and I can get to the hospital and I can give blood. So just to keep this simple, in this little short scene, my goal is to leave the classroom in the next 20 seconds. And oh my God, if I don't do it, my brother dies. But what is in my way? What stands in my way? A chair, oh my God, there's a chair in my way. Now, I think you would say, that doesn't seem like a very good conflict design because that seems kind of easy. You could go around the chair, you could go over the chair. <laughs> you don't know me, I can't go over a chair, but I could go around the chair. I could move the chair, I'm not limber enough to go over a chair. But anyway, I can deal with the chair and leave. So I had a goal, I had meaningful stakes, it was just too easy. So let's make it harder. Let's put two chairs, let's put three chairs. Does that make it more interesting? Not really. 
let's put a human opposition. Let's say there's a complaining student and they're like, Corey, you can't leave. The class still has half an hour. And I'm like, my brother's going to die. And they're like, well, people die all the time. I want to be a writer. You can't. And at some point, look, I love you, but hey, I'm sorry. And I kick the chair out of my way and off I go. Has that made it more interesting? I think so. Has it made it interesting enough to make a studio reader want to keep reading? No, it's not that. In it's a little more interesting. It's not that interesting. So let's make it even harder. And now let's assume, let's have fun and say this is a uh, like a Quentin Tarantino script. So there's always the threat of stylized violence and you're in the mood for that. And so I explain in the class, I gotta leave, my brother's gonna die, oh my God, the chair me away, completing student, eh, okay, just blah, kick the chair, and then bam, there's a gunshot, what? And there's that, 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 that student in the back that everyone knows is wired a little bit, and they've got a gun, and they shot it, and they put the gun at me, and they're like, I hate your brother. And you take one step towards that door, I'll shoot you, I'll kill you, and they mean it, and I know they mean it. Now, assuming this is, tonally appropriate and it makes sense, you know, this is like a Tarantino type project and you care about me and you care about my brother, eh, this could get your attention. This is now getting to be rather interesting. Here's what I want you to take away from this. When I had to leave the classroom in 20 seconds and what stood in my way was a chair, two chairs, three chairs, did you know, could you confidently figure out how this is going to resolve? Yeah, I was going to leave. You didn't know how I was gonna deal with the chairs, but you don't really care. When there was a complaining student, did you know how it was gonna resolve? Yeah, you were gonna go out the door. I don't know what you were gonna do about the complaining student, that was a little more interesting than a chair, but you were gonna leave. Now, Quentin Tarantino version, gun pointed at my head, do you know how that's gonna resolve? No, you don't. So let's do the math. So. Part of what I can teach you in the modern story tools is deep heart of darkness, which is required to get people to really care about the character. So let's say you really care about the character and the character is trying to accomplish something and it really matters to you how this plays out. And suddenly it looks so difficult, you don't know how it's gonna play out. What does that make you have to keep doing? It makes you have to keep reading or keep watching. And that's why conflict is so important. The chairs were an inconvenience. I'm sorry, let me, let me repeat that, or let me, let me rephrase that. The chairs were obstacles. The complaining student was an inconvenience. The person with a gun was opposition. Opposition must rise to the level that we have no idea how things are gonna play out. So many writers, use a mixture of chairs, complaining student, and person with a gun, and that's why they're amateurs. Doesn't mean you have to have a gun. I mean, um, you know, in the class, or you, you, you can see examples your own. There's lots of strong opposition that doesn't require a gun. It's anytime you're watching something and you're like, oh my God, I have no idea how Fleabag's gonna get that priest to sleep with her, or I have no idea how this guy is gonna, in the bear, uh, Carmi's gonna get this guy to give him the meat at half price. Like, you just don't know, but it matters to you. It makes you have to keep watching. That's why you can't have a career if you can't write in conflict. So that's one of the seven pieces. And if you don't check out the modern story tools, if you don't take a class from me, if you just start applying this to your scripts, you're gonna be a stronger writer. I'll tell you a true story. So I was in film school and a friend said, hey, there's a screening, you wanna go? And I'm like, yeah, jumped in the shower, ran out, got in her car, and off we went. I didn't even know what the screening was for. That's the great thing about film school. It's like movie summer camp. Someone's like, there's a screening, you're like, I'll go. Now I'm like, what's the screening? Where is it? What is parking like? Yeah. Can I get some food? <laughs> you know, like, but back then I'm like, screening, let's go. So it was a Coen brother movie. I didn't know that. Who was sitting two rows behind me? Joel and Ethan Coen. Now, you know, when you live in LA, you learn not to be starstruck. And I had done a project at that time for Ridley Scott. I'd done a project for uh, Harrison Ford. I remember getting lost in a parking garage once and, I, and Jack Lemmon, when he was still alive, was there and lost and we walked together and talked. I got lost in another, I get, 
I, I get lost in parking garages. I always park, I go and I come back. This is before the phone, iPhone, I take a picture. I'd always like, I know where my car is and it, I was wrong. I've called the police before, I'm embarrassed to say. Someone's stolen my car. No, I just have a terrible sense of direction. Anyway, I've seen, I met Steve Martin when I was lost in a parking garage and I'm cool about it. I was geeking out that I'm a, such a little writer nerd, a little fanboy. That was like, okay, after the movie, Joel and Ethan went up and they took questions and they were talking about their process and they said something that just blew me away. They said, when we were starting out, we wanted to be writing like the strongest conflict. We knew, you know, when, you, when nobody knows you, you got to write the best script to stand out and get noticed. So when we would put our character into a real jam, we had a rule. If we could figure a way out for the character in, in less than a week, we wouldn't use it. Like when you're watching Breaking Bad, Walter White gets into a jam and he's got five seconds to figure it out and you're playing along at home. Like, I would, no, I would die. I would die. No, that wouldn't work. I, yeah, I would die. And then at the last second, Walter White is something and you're like, oh my God, that's brilliant. Walter White's brilliant. Walter White's not brilliant. There were 19 writers that took three weeks to figure that out. Walter White had five seconds to figure it out. So they said, if we could figure out a way out in six days, we didn't use it. And I just remember going, whoa, whoa. I didn't realize writing could be that hard, but that is brilliant. But then I was suspicious, like, is that true or are they exaggerating? Like, I'm gonna find out one day. And about two years later, I was at a party and Ethan Cohen was there and I went up to him and I was talking, I'm like, you probably don't remember me, but two years ago I was at the screening, blah, blah, blah. And you guys said the thing about the opposition and I said, and he's like, yeah, I don't know if you remember or not, but he's like, yeah. And I gotta ask you, like, is that really true? Like, did you really not use anything I just gotta know, was that really true or did you kind of exaggerate? And he just kind of looked at me and he said, what do you think? And he smiled and he walked away. And I'm like, ah, so I still don't know. But um, I shared this story with my students and I've had students saying, I'm gonna do that. And they have had a lot of success. Now I'm not saying that you have to hold yourself to this standard, you can, but what I am saying is, don't use chairs and don't use complaining students. Go back through anything you've written and be honest with yourself or have someone else read it and have them be honest with you. There's a really good chance that at least one or two places in your script or more, the opposition doesn't rise to the level if we don't know how this is gonna play out. And if that's true, that's where people stop reading. So this could really make a difference. Now here's the offer. So I have, a workshop series. And as I said before, you're probably sick of me saying this, I've had over 3,000 writers who've taken it have success. And yes, I'm saying that for promotional purposes, but I'm also saying it because I know what it's like to be a young writer and think this is impossible. And here's the thing, if I could do it, anyone can do it. And if these 3,000 people can do it, anyone can do it. Um, but you have to be using these tools of compelling conflict, uh, relentless pursuit, targeted escalations, intriguing question, and deep heart of darkness. So, uh, in the past, everything I do is no refunds, all sales are final. For two weeks after this video drops, go to my website and go to the free stuff tab and you'll see a link. And what you can do is you can try out the modern story tools. And if you're not absolutely 100% excited about what it's going to do for you, we'll give you all your money back. And I know that there are people that said, I'll give you all your money back, but you need a team of lawyers because <laughs> they're going to make you jump through so many hoops. But um, my principle when I started out is just treat writers the way I, I would like to be treated. So it's going to be really simple. If you want your money back, you're going to email us. We're going to go, ah, darn. Okay, here's your money back. So that'll be for two weeks after this video drops. Um, so you have nothing to lose. Check it out. Uh, these modern story tools are a big reason why so many of the writers we train have success. And I'd very much love to add you to our list of success. Corey, you say if you can't answer this one question, your script will be rejected? Yes. Um, true story. I broke into business by selling a pitch to Ridley Scott called Metropolis when I was in film school. And then uh, I was flown to London to work with really to flesh out the, the story before I go to write it. So it was really crazy. I mean, I'm in film school and then I'm on a plane flying first class, which I didn't, not even, not only have I never flown first class, I didn't know it existed. <laughs> and this is how dumb I am. They were coming by like 
food and alcohol. And I was like, no, no, because I, I can't afford any of that. And then when I was in London, someone was like, you don't pay for that in first class. We paid for it. And I'm like, so I ate really well on the way home. But anyway, so I'm in London and I'm just like, my big thing is I don't want really to realize I'm a student and I don't know what I'm doing and I just don't want to get fired the first day. I want to survive one day before I get fired. I was very freaked out. So I go into the meeting. I'm just trying to act like I belong. Uh, I don't feel like I do, but I'm trying. Really, Scott's a hero of mine. Anyway, we come down to business and he's like, so uh, Metropolis, what's it about? So I give him like the, the, the plot overview, you know, like if you're flipping through your DVR and there was like a description and he said, oh yeah, yeah. Um, what I mean is like, what's it really about? Like at its core, what's it about? And I remember going two thoughts like, oh boy, I'm done. Like I, no one taught me this in film school. I'm not even sure what he's asking. And then the other thing is like, to just look confident. Cause I was doing a lot of improv at the time, like look confident and give an answer. So I'm like, Oh, Oh, that's what you mean. And I gave him an answer and he's like, Oh, that's interesting. But what do you think it's really about? Which was a nice way of saying swing and a miss kid. And I kept giving him answers and he kept saying, what do you think it's really about? And then eventually he took mercy on me. He changed the subject to something I could do. He talked for a while and we were done. And then we were going to meet the next day. And my plan was first time in London, an American in London, I was going to go get into trouble and see the sights. But no, went back to my hotel room and called everyone I knew in LA like, what's he asking me? What do I answer? I don't want to get fired. And someone uh, uh, was married to a professional writer and she was nice enough to get on the phone with me and explain what Ridley was asking. And, and I'll get to this in a little bit. So then I had to figure out what, what he's asking is at its core, what is the one thing, the unifying thing that everything is about? And I will continue the really Scott story in a moment, but I just want to impress upon everyone listening how important this is because I wouldn't have known this if I hadn't gone through this ordeal. And now on the other side of working with writers, it's just really clear that really smart writers don't get this until it's explained to them. It's, not, it's just not intuitively obvious. So I want you to imagine a really crazy story. It's going to take a few minutes, but stay with me because it's really important. Imagine that you have a friend who wants to be a professional home builder and they have to write a, or build a spec home. Like you have to write a spec script and sell it or at least get someone to see their spec home and say, you're amazing. I'm going to hire you to build a home for me. Okay. And let's say that, you know, land is really expensive, but they inherited this little island so they could build anywhere for free but they only have enough money to buy enough lumber and supplies to build one house. So they can only build one house. They take you to the island and they say, where should I build it? Should I build a beach house? Should I build a forest house? Should I build a mountain house? Over I only have one shot. I got to sell this house. Where do I build it? And you say, I think those are all great options. You, you, you can't go wrong with any of those. And they're like, I know, but what's the best? And you're like, they're all the best. Just pick one and build it. You're going to be great. You run into your friend a few years later, they're just like, ah, oh, I am no good at home building. I couldn't get a real estate agent. I couldn't this, I suck. And then you're like, no, no, you have so much talent. And they're like, no, oh, I suck. And you're like, can I see the house? And they're like, oh, you don't want to see the house. It's, it's embarrassing. And I'm like, no, no, I want to see the house. And they're like, all right. So they take you to the island. Now this is where the story gets crazy, but this is the important part. Imagine that your friend for some crazy reason just couldn't decide where to build the house. So they built part of it in the forest, part of it in the beach and part of it they only had enough supplies for one house. So it's just piles of rubble, you know, part of a wall, part of a this, part of, so it's like pile of rubble over here, pile of rubble over here, pile of rubble over here. No one wanted to buy a pile of rubble. No one looked at that pile of rubble and said, oh, you're the person I want to give all my money to to build a house for me. This is what writers do all the time. They go wide, they don't go deep. What is your story about? What is the singular thing, the singular unifying experience? that everything is built on. Writers will build part of their story on this, and part of it on this, part of it on this. And if your story is about more than one thing, it's not about anything. It's not a novel. It's a screenplay. It's a pilot script. It's got to be a deep exploration of one experience. What is that experience? It is the most important question that you can ask. Um, I think the best screenplay ever written is Network. And it was written by Patty C. And I'm saying Patty C not to be cool or hip, 
but I am dyslexic and there's some names I can't pronounce and I can't pronounce Patty's last name and I feel bad because I butcher it. So when I say Patty C, not trying to be cool, I just can't pronounce his last name. Um, I saw a video where he said, I feel sorry for the writer who doesn't know what their story is about. And he would not write until he knew what it was about. And it took him a year to figure out what network was about, which is a question. How do you live your life when you live in a society that doesn't value human life? And everything in network is a is reflection of that and a meditation on that and built on that. And it creates that magic cohesion and it creates that deep emotional impact. And once he knew what it was, how do you live your life when you live in a a society that no longer values human life. He, he typed it on an index card and he put it above his typewriter and it was a North Star. Uh, I, I trained someone who went on to work on Mad Men. Same thing, uh, Matthew Weiner had the what's it about on the wall. So they would always navigate toward it. For Mad Men, what it was about was the inherent conflict between that which you most want to do and that which you need to do. So what you need to do, but what you want to do, that inherent conflict in everything in Mad Men, every storyline and subplot and character, it was all built on that. So people came in and they would pitch like, okay, season three, what are possible storylines? And you go around the room and throw out all these ideas. There'd be great ideas that didn't sit on that piece of land, so it wouldn't be used. It's so important in a TV show to have a cohesive, deep experience. Even if you don't know consciously what it is. Like, I've seen Network five times and before that interview, I never said, oh, I love Netflix. Or Netflix, no, I don't love Netflix. I love Network. Um, what a brilliant meditation and exploration on that inherent uh, question of how do you live your life when you live in a society that no longer values human life. I didn't see that consciously, I did, but Patty did. And once I heard Patty say that on a video, obviously since passed, I went back and read the script and watched the movie and I was like, oh my God, everything. I was in Santa Monica at the Aero Theater uh, watching one of my favorite 70s film, um, Dog Day Afternoon. And Frank Pearson, the writer, amazing writer, was there. This was a few years before he passed away. And he did questions. And someone asked him like what his writing process was. So this was, this is really, um, if you're at all interested in writing, you should really remember this. So what happened with that project is he had four months to write a draft and they were gonna give it to Al Pacino. And Al Pacino would read that draft and say, yes, I'm gonna make this movie, or no, I'm not. And they weren't gonna to go to anyone else. So it was one shot, Al Pacino, and this thing that uh, Frank had been working on for so long, he had one shot. And so he had four months to write the best possible script. And someone was like, what did you do? And he said, well, I spent three months figuring out what the story was singularly about and one month writing it. That tells you something that the best writers use 75% of his scarce time to figure this out. Now, once you know what it's about, it's your best friend and your worst enemy. So with Ridley Scott, every day I kept coming in and I knew what he was asking, but I couldn't get the answer. It's hard and it seemed like months of torture, but it was like five days. And I finally said something, he's like, Ooh, write that down. I'm like, okay, write that down. He goes, repeat it back to me. And I did, he goes, change this word, because precision matters. And he kept having me refine it, and he looked around the room, he goes, read it again. Looked around the room, read it again. Looked around the room, he said, will you do me a favor and circle it? Oh, it's circled, Ridley. And he goes, that's what it's about. And I was like, wow. I just survived my first gauntlet. And everything had to be built on that. And here's why it's your worst enemy. We, once we knew it was about, we were really cruising and we had almost the whole structure, but we could never come up with a great opening. We had okay openings, but we all felt like we didn't have an opening. And one day really comes in with a skip and a step and he's like, have you ever seen Blade Runner? And I didn't tell him this, but uh, I got fired for the first and only time because of Blade Runner. So when I was a kid, I lied about my age, pretending to be older so I could work in a movie theater. And it was an old dollar movie house, which they used to have. And I was an usher, so my job was to sweep and 
do ushery stuff. And what I did is I'd come in and I'd sweep into the theater showing Blade Runner <laughs> and then I'd sit there for eight hours and then I'd sweep my way to the time card and go home. And about three weeks later, the manager said, Mandel, my office, I want to talk to you. And I'm like, okay, Mr. I forget his name, but anyway. So I walk in the office and he goes, have a seat. And I do. And he goes, it appears to me that I am paying you to watch Blade Runner every day. Is this true? And I'm like, yeah, basically. And he goes, why am I paying you to do that? And I'm like, I don't know. And he goes, you're fired. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> so like, I get it. So yes, I'm a fan of Blade Runner, but I didn't want to look like a weird fanboy. So I said, I've seen it a couple of times. And he said, so we had an opening that we loved, but we couldn't afford it. We were on a pretty limited budget, but for this movie, we could do it. I think with an adjustment, this is our opening. Would you be open to me telling you what this opening is? Like, oh yes, Ridley, I'm open to, yes, go ahead, you know, let's hear it. So he's pitching me this opening, I'm just writing it down, and it's brilliant, it's so good. And I'm, I have chills, because I'm like, my name's going on this script, and people don't think I figured this out, but I didn't. This is just such a great opening. Why didn't I think of this? And then I'm, he's almost done, and he goes, oh, dang it. Now nah, we can't use it. I'm like, what, what, we can't use it? What do you mean we can't use it? We can't use it. I'm like, really, this is awesome. He goes, yeah, but it's not connected to the what's it about. And I wanted to say, you know, F the what's it about, <laughs> like, but he had artistic integrity, like everything. So when you don't know what your story is about, you're just groping in the darkness, trying to figure out what your story is and what belongs or what doesn't. Once you know what it's about, you're going downhill in sunlight and the light is just in the breeze and that's great. But then you're going to be tested because you're going to have some problem with your script, something you're stuck with, and you're going to finally have a great solution, but doesn't connect to what it's about. And then the question is, do you have artistic integrity or not? So it's your best friend and it's your worst enemy. Um, now people will ask, is this the same thing as a log line? No. A log line is a selling tool. So Vince Gilligan's log line for Breaking Bad was, it's Mr. Chips goes, it's Mr. Chips goes to, um, no, no, I'm sorry. It's, um, yeah, it's Mr. Chips becomes Scarface. It's Mr. Chips becomes Scarface. Now that's an interesting idea. Mr. Chips becomes Scarface. Tell me more. Let me read the script. It's interesting. That's what a, log line does. It can't be what it's about because not everything is, that's the Walter White journey, that change, but what about Skyler? What about Saul? What about all the other characters? Like that can't be what it's about. No. Uh, Vince Gilligan very slyly and smartly tells you what it's about in the second scene. In the second scene of the pilot, Walter White is talking to his chemistry class. And he says, what is chemistry? And he says, it's the, some scientific ionic bonds and this and that. He goes, but that's not what it's about to me. And he looks into the camera and he says, this is what it's about to me. It's about the study of change. That's what the whole show is about. That was the what's it about for the entire show. So I remember uh, a couple years ago, I got a call uh, from a student. She was just so excited and impressed. She was working at Warner Brothers and she was a creative executive and she got invited to some meetings uh, that the head of Warner Brothers was taking with very big writers. And she called me and she goes, I didn't know that the head of Warner Brothers was your student. And I'm like, I don't think they were. She goes, no, they were your student. And I'm like, I don't think so. And well, then they're stealing your stuff. And I'm like, okay, What's going on? What happened? I'm in this room and, he, and he's having these meetings with these big writers and he's always asking them, what's it about? And if they give an answer that's not one thing, is no, no, no. If it's about more than one thing, it's not about anything. So if, you, if, if he didn't teach you that, if you, if you didn't teach him that, you know, he stole that from you. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, I, I stole it from them. Like, I'm teaching what the industry does. The industry's not doing what I'm teaching. I learned this from Ridley Scott. And it's so, so important that you know what your story is about, and it's a singular thing, and then you go deep, and you connect everything to it, 
That is absolutely required if you want to have any chance of anyone in the industry paying attention to either your pitch or your script. Why do 99% of writers fail, Corey? So, so many writers have a dream to succeed and they work really hard to learn the skills to grow their talent and they're really dedicated and they, they don't succeed and they feel like, well, you know, I've learned all these tools and I work all the time and I guess I don't have what it takes. I want, if you ever find yourself in that place, I want you to remember something that there's three things that are required. There's a missing piece. So yes, skill, talent. Talent is repeatable skills. You have to build right in conflict. You have to build the right, great characters and dialogue and heightened concepts. Yes, all of that. Yes. And you're going to probably have to work hard to develop that. But once you do, and you have that talent, you obviously need dedication, right? You can have all the talent in the world. If you don't work hard, not going to happen. Okay. But you have all the talent, you have all the dedication, and you can fail. Which then tells people, I guess I don't have what it takes. I want you to think about Bruce Springsteen. He's pretty good, right? Uh, he's not a rock and roll star. He's a rock and roll god. And I think he would agree, incredibly talented. I think he would agree, incredibly dedicated. He didn't go to college. He didn't get married. He was just playing music all the time for like 10 years for no money. Just he was all in on his dream and worked so hard on his ability. He got a record deal at Columbia. He had a year to make his album. They supported him with money and background music and they promoted the heck out of it and went out and it bombed. The great Bruce Springsteen bombed. I gave him a second chance because they saw his potential. So he spent another year and just poured, I mean, everything into the second album. And they spent so much money on promotion. And it's Bruce Springsteen. So you know what happened? That second album bombed. Now, it's very easy at this point to say, I was pretty good at music. It's made two albums. The biggest record company in the world is promoting it. Nobody wants to listen to it. I guess I don't have what it takes. But God smiled on Bruce Springsteen and he got a third chance. And his third album was Born to Run. And his third album is one of the most successful records of all time. It sold tens of millions of copies. It made him a rock and roll god. In the 1970s, if you wanted to be famous, there's two things you could do. Get on the cover of Newsweek or get on the cover of Time magazine. In the same week, Bruce Springsteen was on the cover of Newsweek and Time. No other musician has ever done that. So I have a question for you. What was different from the third album, from the first two albums? He had all the talent. He had all the dedication, but there was something missing. It's not luck. There's no luck involved. Luck is what the losers point to. Born to Run is a transcendent, magical album. It would have been so successful if it came out 10 years earlier or 10 years later. Heck, if it came out today as a brand new album, it would be amazing. What is different? If you are serious about writing or acting or directing, whatever your creative pursuit is, you need to know this answer. What was different? And what was different was John Landau. John Lando was a writer for the Rolling Stone, discovered Bruce, knew that Bruce was just a generational talent. And after the second album, he went to Bruce and said, can I be your producer? Can I produce your third album? And they met and they talked and Bruce trusted him and respected him. And Bruce said, yes. Now, John Lando did not produce the first album, did not produce the second album. He produced Born to Run. And what I'm about to say is something that Bruce Springsteen and John Landau have said publicly many times. So I'm just sharing what they said. John Landau said that what he needed to do was adjust, not very much, but he had to adjust Bruce's process. We live in a world where people ignore process. They, they focus on results, success or failure. Process is how you create product. I can always track the best scripts back to the best process. And I work with writers, I can always track their scripts that fail back to failed process. Process, process, process. If you were a golfer and you weren't getting the results you wanted, you would see someone who would break down your swing and re-engineer your swing because your swing is your process. 
as a writer, if you're writing and not getting the results you want, what writers do is they either quit or they just double down and keep writing scripts thinking, well, you gotta be in the right place at the right time. And they keep writing and they create a pile of similarly flawed scripts. Process, process, process. You have to improve your process. The great Bruce Springsteen needed an adjustment in process. So who can do that for you? Managers can do that for you. Uh, mentors, writers. It's something I do in my workshops and also one-on-one, -on -one, but not taking one-on-one -on -one clients. Or if you don't have the money or you don't have the time, uh, you're fortunate to live in a time when there's so much free digital content. So you can go back and watch, if you haven't already, a lot of Film Courage videos. You can also go to podcasts. And there are a lot of writers who talk about their process. Now, it's really important that you don't just find a writer that you love and say, oh, I'm gonna do her process. No, no, no. There is a process that allows Tina Fey to write to the best of her ability. There's a process that allows you know, Greta Gerwig to write to the best of her ability. That's not the process that's gonna allow you to write. You gotta find your process. So when I work with writers, I do process coaching. And what I always tell a writer, and I specifically wanna tell this to any of you who never work with me, I always tell a writer, I am not smart enough to look at your writing and talk to you and know what process is gonna work best for you. You're not smart enough to know. You have to experiment. I will tell you this, most writers' default process holds them back. Most writers' default process plays to their strengths and hides their weaknesses. And if you keep doing that, your weaknesses get weaker and your strengths get stronger. So when I do this work with writers, I will give them a range of processes to use to see what the results are. And then we'll start to fine tune and start to find your process. And you do not have to work with me. Um, it's cool that you can, again, if you have some time and energy, listen to the Film Courage videos, listen to podcasts, listen to very successful writers. They'll talk about their process. So you could start to collect lots of different writers' processes and you could start playing with some of those and experimenting with some of those. If you're not gonna work with me, let me give you a piece of advice. Find seven writers that you really respect that, that talk about their process. Not all writers do, but a lot of writers do because there's so much you know, uh, interviews out there. So find at least seven writers that you respect who share their process and write down what their process is. And then what I want you to do is look at those processes, those seven processes, and say, which one do I think is gonna work best for me? And then which one would I be most excited to try? It might be the same one, might be a different one. And then, okay, which one do I know isn't gonna work for me? There's no way. Start with that one. Start with that one. Because writers, I always tell writers this, either you control your process or your process controls you. I'll just give you an example. I worked with a writer, really smart, had a manager, but couldn't get a career. And in working with their process and getting to know them, it became clear that when they had a problem with their script, they had to make a really big decision, solve a big problem, they'd get anxious and stressed, most people do. And they think about it until they could find a really good solution and they'd use it. That's a flaw in your process. So what I said is, okay, so you have this script and you have this problem and you have this solution, which makes a lot of sense, great. I want you to pretend that your agent said, I cannot go out to the marketplace with a script that has this solution. I need you to come up with a different solution and you gotta pitch it to me in three days. Come back in three days and pitch me that solution. And then I said, okay, I want to pretend that your man or your agent said, nope, you have three days, you get me a different solution or I drop you. And come back in three days and then I do it. I'm gonna have them do four or five. And here's what they're gonna realize. Some of the time, their first one, the first good one they came up with is the best. Sometimes the fourth one is the best. And I ask them, do you want to write the fastest script, the easiest script, or the best script? Do you want a chance of a career, or do you want the best chance of the best possible career? So this is what it takes. When you're stuck on a problem, don't use 
the first good solution you come up with. That goes on the option list. Come up with five, seven other great options. And then I'll say, why don't you think of the worst option, the, the, the way you know would be a disaster, and just go write that real quick. Try all this out. That's, that's what creativity is. Creativity is an exploration. And we often learn more from our mistakes than our successes. So that's just one example of a process glitch where smart people will have a problem, they'll think about it, they'll come up with their first good answer and use it without exploring other options. And sometimes if they're pushed to do that, the sixth option they come up with is going to be the reason they have a career. I'll give you one more example of a process glitch. I worked with another writer, super talented, always close to a career, never had a career. And in working with her, it became really clear that she really connects with her characters. She really feels and sees them as real people. And she has like a, a maternal instinct to protect her characters. And so I started to give her a process training where she had to take the character she loved the most and just do the brutally worst things to these characters. She had to kill her characters in the worst possible ways. It was so painful. But then when she was done, she's like, you know, that was kind of fun. I mean, the character's still there. I'm still there. And because if you're protecting your characters, if you're protecting them from pain or yourself from the pain, you can only go so far as a writer. Um, you know, the reason Breaking Bad and Fleabag and The Bear are so great is those writers are so courageous. They just go into their pain and they write from there and they do not protect the characters because we want to have an emotional experience. We want to be emotionally changed. And this is, it's really important. And I'd like to sort of talk about it if you permit me in a much bigger way. Um, Everything in life seems to divide us and everyone's on teams and one team has all the answers and the other team are idiots and the other team has all the answers and they're an idiot. And corporations and governments often do things to keep us aroused and angry and suspicious because that is how they can keep our attention and they can get us to watch and they can get us to buy or to donate. And this is not a, a problem for one side or the other. It's a problem for everyone. And let me share a quote, um, a really great quote from James Baldwin. And he says, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they'll be forced to deal with their pain. And I think that's really powerful. I can resonate and connect with that. I think that um, there's a lot of pain that people don't want to experience. And we live in a society that says, don't deal with your pain, cope with your pain. And one way of coping with your pain is this medication or alcohol or work a lot or sex or just get really angry at the other side and just live in this perpetual self-righteous anger. And I think as a society, we've sort of lost our ability to deal with pain. And you know, we used to have rituals when people died or terrible things that we came together and there were rituals, but, but a lot of those rituals have fallen away in the modern world. And there's just a lot of hatred and anger and fear because there's a lot of pain that people don't want to face. And so it's so important that you can, as a writer, write from that pain, don't protect your characters because that is one of the ways you can help make the world a better place is that you can tell stories like Fleabag um, where characters choose or are forced to confront their deepest pain and come out the other side a better person, a more whole person, a more healthy person. We need to viscerally, like, you can't just lecture people. You can't just people, can't tell people to do that. They'll just tune you out. But you create a character that they, they spend their lives with that they're viscerally connected to they get to experience that. Or you could do the opposite, like Succession or The Bear, where you can have characters who refuse, refuse to deal with their inner pain. And they just live in this, just this aroused hatred, suspicion, and you just see the destruction.
These are important. I mean, writing can help make the world a better place because writing is how we get shared values. It's how we get empathy. It's, it, it can bring people together. It's one of the few things that Red America and Blue America, we, we can viscerally be excited by similar stories. I mean, God help us if that goes away. So I know I, I got on my soapbox and I apologize, but I was talking about process and how important process is. So um, if you can get someone to help you with process, do it. It's going to expedite your learning curve. It is going to dramatically increase your chances of success. If Bruce Springsteen could use it, we all could use it. But if you can't find someone, a mentor is willing to do it for free, and you can't pay someone like myself or someone else, um, it, it'll be longer and harder, but you could still do this. You're fortunate to live again in this era where you can listen to different writers' process. Just remember, everyone's focused on outcome and product. Process is how you create outcome. Improve your process, improve your outcome. You don't improve your process, you keep making the same mistakes. Simple as that. So when John Landau took Bruce Springsteen under his wing or however it worked, was that Bruce's blind spot? His process? Oh. We talked um, about that earlier. Yeah, blind. so for me, there's strengths, weaknesses, and blind spots. Blind spots are weaknesses you don't know you have. Um, weaknesses are weaknesses you know you have. I don't know. They, n neither of them identify that. Okay. I can't speak for Bruce. But I'll tell you what John Landau did for him. Um, and it's something I went into great detail in a, uh, a previous Film Courage or an upcoming Film Courage video. I don't know the order these are going to be. Where I talked about there's one question you have to answer uh, for your script to succeed or one answer or your script will fail. Uh, and if you haven't yet watched that, watch that Film Courage video because that, that singular what's it about, that is the tweak in the process that John Lowndow used. So in that album, Bruce had all of these lyrics. He had all of this experience. And this is what's important. What's it about? It's not intellectual. It's not theme. It's about what do people experience. Even if you don't consciously know you're experiencing it, you're experiencing it. Because that's what we want. We want impactful experiences. And so they looked at that and they realized there was a lot of different experiences at that time because Bruce had all these different songs. And in fact, Born to Run, uh, he shared, I think he had like 40 pages of lyrics. And I would imagine they were all just amazing. But it was the question of, and this is the most important decision, what's it about? And they worked on it for a long time. And finally, this is what they came up with. This is the unifying experience of Born to Run. And you listen to any of the songs and you're going to feel this. It's about friendship. Look at the cover art for the album. Listen to the songs. It all makes you feel friendship. I mean, it's a lot of it is like what friendship felt like when you were 20 or 22 years old in the summer and like you had infinite freedom and all these possibilities. You know, it was a, it was a romantic friendship -y feeling, but everything in that. So he took those 50 pages of lyrics and he talks about this and he reduced it down to half a page that focused on that piece of land, that, that what's it about. So in, in that video that, uh, you can see or will soon see when it drops, um, which is the one question you have to answer about your script. I go into great detail about uh, the what's it about. Um, it was cool. I, I learned it from Ridley Scott, um, and it was many years later that I watched a documentary that uh, Bruce made about Born to Run, and he talked about it, and I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 that's what it, that, and then of course, of course, like this is just, it's the one question all artists need. I um, have heard Steve Martin talk about how he creates or used to create his routine and other, it's the same, Richard Pryor, the same thing. So this is like the secret to the creative universe. What if a writer does not know if they're a conceptual writer or an intuitive writer? Yeah, great question. So I can, I can tell in 10 seconds, but I've been doing this a while. So. What I'll do is, well, I can tell by reading it, but that's not going to be helpful to the writer. The writer can't necessarily read it. 
But here's what a writer can do. So I'll, I'll ask a writer questions. So let, I can tell from a writer and I haven't read their writing. So what I'll do is, um, now they have to have written at least a script. So I'll say, let's talk about the last script you wrote. Uh, Why did you write it? You know, what was your inspiration? What was your jumping off point? What did you get excited about? And just listen, and I can tell in 10 seconds. So if it's a conceptual writer, first of all, they're gonna be answering from just their voice. It's gonna be answering from the more analytical, intellectual part of the brain, and you just can hear that. But also they're gonna be talking about uh, they started with an idea, a concept. Ooh, no one's done a thriller where, you know, or this I thought would be a really good comedy. Or they'll talk about, oh, a twist ending they had, um, or an opening story stuff. Or they might be talking about world. Conceptual writers love world building. So could be world building, could be a concept, an idea, part of a story, a beginning, a twist ending, a this, a con that's, now, when you, when you talk to an intuitive writer, they're going to be talking about it from a more emotionally authentic, vulnerable place. And they're almost always going to say, well, so there's this character, you know, and it, it, it's a character. Or, or it's something personal. And they might be able to say, like, I worked with a writer once and she's like, yeah, I just went through this really painful divorce. And uh, I either just cry myself to sleep every night and drink or I could write about it. Okay, so that's an intuitive writer. Or sometimes they don't even know. They'll say, I don't know. And they're almost embarrassed. But like, I had to write this. I, I just had to write this. That's an intuitive writer. So what is your inspiration? What got you excited? Another thing I'll ask is, okay, so when you're working on this script, was there ever a point where you got in a, like it got tough, like you, you got lost or you, you, you didn't know what to do? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. And I go, what did you do? And, you know, an intuitive writer, they are, they're going to find the solution in the character and just what feels right. And the conceptual writer is like, well, I thought, you know, for the someone who reads it, it'd be good if this happens. And they're just coming at it from a completely different space. Now, just to confuse this for a moment, I always get in my workshops, I get, I'd say, 90% of the writers, within a few weeks, they know they're conceptual or intuitive. And there's no gender to this. I mean, I have equal amount of conceptual writers who are men and women, same with intuitive. But there's always like one or two or three writers who will say, I'm so confused. Um, I really thought I was intuitive because of this, but then I thought I was conceptual. When I did this exercise, I feel like I'm both, but I don't think I do either that great. Exactly. There's a small percentage of writers, I call them slidable. So if you think about like the um, conceptual and the intuitive, and most people, obviously, unless you've had like brain damage, you have access to both parts and you use different parts. You know, when you sleep, you're using your intuitive. When you're solving math, you're doing the conceptual. Um, but most people will hang out here as a writer or hang out here. But there's some small percent of writers that just slide back and forth, back and forth. So they're like, oh yeah, I thought it was, no, I thought it was this. And they, they're like kind of equally comfortable they just slide back and forth, but they're not strong enough in either space. So they will just pick one space, stay there, get really strong at it, then go over here and get really strong at this. If you are slidable, you should celebrate because that's the hardest part. So I'm, I'm a diehard conceptual writer. So when I was doing this training, it was so hard to turn off the conceptual brain. It was so hard to go over here. And when I was over here, at some point, I'd have a conceptual thought or a conceptual concern, and I'd just go, Voom! and I would just stay here. Um, I had to learn how to slide back and forth effortlessly. That's the hardest thing for me to teach someone. And some people naturally do it. I don't know why, but they do. So it's possible someone listening to this, they answer the questions that I ask, and they're like, I kind of think I'm both. That is possible. But you might need to get stronger at one or both sides. What is a high concept idea? I'll try to answer it, but I actually think that's a total mistake to think that way. So um, what I was taught, and I think what most people are taught, is a high concept is bigger. Bigger is better. And a high concept is, is a concept that's so exciting that people are going to want to buy this. Not, they don't even need to see the characters or the script. Just that concept is great. And you know, a classic example people will give is Jaws. You know, which was a huge blockbuster movie, or people talk about Breaking Bad. Um, 
look, there's a lot of different people out there. Everyone has their opinion and different people resonate with you. Um, I, I personally will ignore anyone who says that and I will suspect they've never had a career as a writer. I've sold a lot of pitches. I've helped writers sell pitches. First off, uh, here's the concept of Jaws and just pretend Jaws didn't exist. And I came in and you're an executive and here I pitch it to you. All right, so there's this shark and it's like killing people and these three guys get on a boat and they gotta go kill the shark. Are you like, oh my God, that's the best idea ever. I, that is just a, no, I mean, Jaws was hugely successful. So they use it as an example, but like that concept is an interesting concept, but like, or Breaking Bad, you know, that's such a great concept. People would buy it in the room. No, that's really, I think, interesting information to Vince Gilligan because he pitched that everywhere in town for four years and everyone passed. So if that's such a high concept that everyone would buy it, that's really interesting. So here's the thing, bigger is not better. This is, writers torture themselves. Oh, it's this love story, but I've got a meteor coming to crash. And like, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't wanna go bigger, you wanna go deeper. So you wanna go deeper and, and you really wanna figure out what is most interesting about your concept and how do you make it more interesting. And how do you make it more interesting? And I'll give you an example, just just because it's top of head, not that. Um, so there's a show that some of you may know, some of you may not know, on Apple TV, and it's called Slow Horses. And it is a uh, British uh, like uh, thriller. And so you've probably heard of MI5, which is like the CIA, like. Think about MI5 in London, it's like very sleek, sophisticated computers, people are well-dressed, and it is like the top spies. Okay, well, in London, they have other um, part, they have other departments, and one of them is called Slow Horse, or Slow Horse, which they call Slow Horse. And Slow Horse is the place you're sent if you really messed up and they wanna punish you. Um, it is like the reject loser spy place to go to. And so if you want to be a spy, you want to be an MI5, maybe you were an MI5, and if you did something terribly wrong, you get reassigned to Slow Horse or Slow Horse. And you wouldn't want anyone to know that because you'd be the laughing stock of the spy community. And once you go to Slow Horses, there's only one thing you want to do, which is find your way out and back to MI5 only there you don't, it's hell. You don't leave hell. If you get, if you get sent to Slow Horses, it's terrible. And uh, Gary Oldman is the lead and he plays a guy who was uh, a James Bond type, you know, super spy. And he now runs Slow Horses, which is a really interesting question. Like why did he get this worst job ever? And I'm not gonna answer that. For those of you who wanna go watch the show, you do eventually find the reason. So. This is, you know, if you think about this, this could be uh, the beginnings of a concept for a comedy. It could be a straight thriller, drama. You could actually go a lot of ways with this. So this is a, um, it's a thriller with, you know, a little bit of humor, but it's not, it's not played for laughs. This is not the bad news bears of spies. Okay. So now if you're developing this, this is an interesting idea. I think you walk in and like, you've heard of MI5, you've heard of the CIA. Did you know that there's slow horses? And you talk about that. And then you talk about these characters and what they did to get there. And of course, some of them deserved it. And others of them just insulted the wrong person's wife accidentally and now out of spite. And so they have their stories and they want to get out of there, but they can't. And what do they do is they get assigned like the parking management jobs, right? Like, so if there's a potential terrorist, uh, MI5 is gonna trail the person and do all this stuff. And Slow Horses is literally doing traffic control. I mean, they do the most menial, horrible things. Okay, not horrible, but just mean, boring stuff. Well, now you're like, okay, this is a great idea, but as a concept, what are we watching week in and week out? We're gonna watch these people do traffic control. I think that's gonna get pretty boring. So you start thinking, what could be a case that they have to do that's gonna be really interesting? Of course, you also gotta figure out why would they get that case? That's part of a writer, you gotta figure that out. And so you would think, well, let's, let's find them having to go up against a really strong adversary, the, the KGB or the Chinese intelligence, or the CIA, or Mossad. 
and you'd be like, yeah, here are these people. And by the way, and this is part of the fun of the show. When we see MI5, it's like everyone's beautiful suits and clothing, super high-tech computers. Uh, they all drive or are chauffeured in these bulletproof black SUVs. Slow Horses is this like decrepit little building with no air conditioning. There's one computer. I mean, they, they also drive their own cars and it's these little, I mean, it's just like this pathetic little operation. Now, if they have to go against the KGB, wow, like there, no way they're gonna be able to do that. And if there's real stakes, and that could be a really cool concept, but you gotta go deeper. You gotta say, well, what would be even more interesting? Would the CIA be more interesting than the KGB or Mossad or, or MI5? What if they're, what if the adversary is MI5? These people who are MI5 got kicked out and they got nothing. What if they got to go against MI5? What if MI5 is doing something very illegal and dangerous and Slow Horses figures it out and now they got to go undercover and out spy, outsmart these people. That's a concept that you could sell. So is that bigger? No, it's more interesting. That's how you heighten and go deeper. You take what is interesting and you keep asking methodical questions to make it as interesting as possible. And that very much can be the difference between people who are interested in you and people buying your work and hiring you. I was taught how to do this by a producer. I never would have sold Metropolis to Ridley Scott had I not known how to heighten that. Was Metropolis high concept? It was heightened concept. I don't believe in high concept. High concept is bigger is better. Now, bigger isn't better. What we want is impactful. We wanna make something interesting and make it as interesting as possible. And instead of going bigger and high, by the way, something that always frustrates me, you talk to anyone who believes in high concept and you say, define it. They can't, or they'll give you a definition that makes no sense. Uh, they'll say, well, it's a concept that when people hear it, they wanna buy it. Oh, well, that's really helpful after the fact. You know, that's a tautology. That's not gonna help anybody. Um, so I don't believe in high concept. I think that's a trap. I believe in heightened concepts. How can a writer take an ordinary idea and transform it into what you call a heightened concept? By doing what Shakespeare did. So let's think about Shakespeare for a moment. Shakespeare started the Globe Theater and it was in a very dangerous, unincorporated part of London because it was illegal in London to have a theater because you didn't, the, the, the royalty did not want common people hearing ideas because that could be dangerous. It was illegal. They would have been killed. So they did it in a place that was unregulated, not part of London. It was in a place where it was uh, brothels and uh, gambling and, and people were, were murdered. And the people who were watching Shakespearean plays had never seen theater before because it used to only be royalty. So their standing is, is basically, unless they have any money, they pay you know, a shilling or a pence and they're standing in this huge pit which is disgusting because there's no bathroom. So let's, you know, and it's the middle of the bubonic plague. So this is, this is pretty disgusting. And this is what's really interesting. When we see a play, we know about the proscenial arc. We know that there's a stage and when the lights go up, there's going to be actors talking. We don't talk to them. We listen. They pretend they don't see us. We don't interact with them and we listen to the play. No one who saw a Shakespearean play knew any of that. They had never seen a play. How do you know that? I mean, they don't know that. So they're talking and drinking and whatever they're doing. And then these people get on stage and start talking. Well, what's to stop them from talking back? What's to stop them from getting on stage and interacting with them? There's only one thing that can stop them, which is the rest of the audience. The rest of the audience has to be like, hey, mate, shut up. I want to hear this. So Shakespeare knew he had to grab people's attention right away. Or, and I'm not kidding, his actors were going to be maybe murdered. And that's not a joke. <laughs> These were rough, drunk people. <laughs> Who knows what would happen? So he has to get people's attention like that. Or this is very dangerous. By the way, if you want to succeed as a writer, you got to get the reader's attention like that. Because as I have said before, studio readers uh, 
we are taught to read the first scene or two and stop. And if we don't have to keep reading, we don't. So you have Shakespeare's problem. Now Shakespeare, here's what he did. He, oh, actually, let me tell you what he didn't do. He didn't do high concept because high concept is just bigger. Like I'll do a story with these people and there's a meteor coming down or there's a murder. And cause here's the thing, people who are watching that can't relate to that. And why would they care? There's a meteor coming. Like, so what? Like that has no connection to them. That's the problem with high concept. Nobody cares. People have to make an emotional connection to want to read the next page or watch. But this is a problem. What if Shakespeare put characters on stage that the audience could relate to? For instance, a male character who has an overbearing father, and no matter what the character does, the father's never happy. And this poor guy is tortured and he can never make his dad happy. Well, you know what? A lot of the people in the audience could relate to that. And you have another character they could relate to. And what would happen? Your actors would be killed because why would they stand in the filth watching what they could watch in real life? Why would they watch something that they can just see all around them in their life? That's not interesting. So we've got a conundrum. If we have something heightened, larger than life, which is what a lot of people like to talk about, nobody cares. If you use real life, people emotionally connect, but why pay for this? Why stand there? So Shakespeare invented a technique that is used today by all successful showrunners and feature film writers. He didn't go heightened concept. He didn't go bigger. What he did is he said, the only way I can hold their attention is by telling extraordinary stories. Extraordinary. Everyone wants to be extraordinary. Well, just think of the word extraordinary. You just divide it. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. So what's ordinary? It's something that everybody can relate to. What is extra? It is heightened version of ordinary. It is a heightened version. So for instance, have I ever been so freaked out about money, so scared that I can't survive, that I have been tempted to do something that's not exactly right? Yes. Have I ever done something that I felt wasn't exactly right? Yeah, a few times. Now, I have shame about that. Did I ever cook crystal meth and sell crystal meth? No, and I would never do that. But when I watch Breaking Bad, I have a guy who's just at the end of his rope and he's economically devastated. It's not fair and his family's gonna be devastated and he's gonna, and I can, I can relate to that. That is ordinary, but this is heightened because he's gonna die and his family's left destitute and he's gonna cook crystal meth. So when I watch that show, I'm like, that's me, but that's not me. Like I can relate to Walter White and go, yeah, I get that, but I would never do that. That's what makes the show so magical because if I watch that and I go, oh my God, that's me, that's what I do, then that's painful, that's not, or, or The Office, uh, either one, but I'm just gonna go with the Ricky Gervais version. So you got this character and he really cares what everyone thinks about him. And when people are talking to him, he's always like trying to pass himself off as an expert. And he goes too far. He exaggerates too much. And he just tries to sound like everyone loves him. He's the greatest boss. But you realize he's just a sad little man. He's like the wizard in the Wizard of Oz behind his little curtain. Okay, can I relate to that? Yes. Do I care what people think about me? Yes. Do I sometimes exaggerate? Yes. Um, is it sometimes me a little pathetic? Probably. My wife would say sometimes. Um, am I delusional that I walk around claiming to do things I haven't done and just brag about things that have no reality? No. 
So when I watch The Office, I'm like, oh my God, that's me. But that's not me. And that's why it's fun and I can laugh because I can identify with the pain, but I could be like, but that's not me. I'm not nearly as pathetic as that guy. So it's ordinary, but it's an extra version. Fleabag, I mean, she, the way she escapes pain is through inappropriate, well, sex, lots of sex. That's her pain avoidance. And her mom died and it caused her so much pain that she sleeps with her best friend's boyfriend, her best friend finds out and ends up dying as a result. And Fleabag now, because she had pain and she couldn't deal with her mom's death, the way she dealt with it was so inappropriate, she now feels responsible, I think justifiably, for her best friend's death. She obviously didn't try to kill her best friend, but it was a result. And now, in the first season and in the second season, she's just trying to have more and more sex to try to disassociate and deal with that pain. Okay, have I had great pain in my life? Yes. Have I done coping mechanisms? Yes. Is it sex? Not for me. Sex was never my thing. I mean, it was never my uh, coping mechanism, but other things were. We don't need to go into that, but other things like being a workaholic, that's one thing. Um, and has, when I've had pain and I've done coping mechanisms, has that negatively impacted people I care about? Absolutely. You know, back when I was a writer, I was a lot of pain. I would, I would just be such a workaholic. I wasn't around my wife and I wasn't really present always in the relationship and that's certainly damaging to her. So I watch Fleabag and I'm like, oh, I can relate to that, but I'm not her. I didn't kill anyone. I didn't do anything that egregious. Um, so it makes it safe and comfortable to watch it. It's like, okay, that's, that's an exaggerated version of me. So Shakespeare with Hamlet, here's a guy whose father is overbearing and Hamlet can't measure up. And the people in the audience can relate to that. But right out of the gate, we learn. Now, people in the audience were like, yeah, my family's really messed up and all this stuff is happening. But here's what's not happening. My uncle did not have sex with my mom and then kill my father to be with his wife. And then my father comes to me as a ghost and says, you must finally be a man and go kill him. Like, okay. My life's messed up and crazy, but it's not that bad. That's an extraordinary opening to one of the most timeless and successful stories ever because it is an ordinary emotional experience that is made extra, that is heightened. Same thing with The Wizard of Oz. Dorothy loves her dog more than anything and She's running from the witch because the witch is going to kill her in Toto. And the only way she can get what she wants is she has to go at the witch. She has to attack the witch with no plan of how to defeat the witch. Well, we all have to do that in life. I mean, this is film courage, so let's talk about courage. I mean, we all have our demons. We all have our witches. And we all want things. We want to be successful as writers or successful as whatever, be successful husbands and wives or parents. We want to be successful, but we want to keep running from the things that scare us the most. And guess what? The only way to really be successful, to stop running away from what scares us and run at what scares us. And that's the only place. That is, that's the courage. You want to talk about courage? There's your courage. Well, I can relate to that. And I usually run away. Sometimes I run at. I didn't have flying monkeys. <laughs> I didn't have a witch. I mean, that especially as a kid, even now, this, the flying monkeys terrify me. So I watch, when we watch it, we can relate to it, but it's heightened. That's what I mean. It's a heightened concept. And that's what Shakespeare did with all of his plays. And he had to. And it's the same technique that the Coen brothers used, the writers of The Bear used, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, Tina Fey, Vince Gilligan, Genji Cohn, and when you learn to do it, then we can add, hopefully, the characters and the stories that are in you. We can add that and impact on the world. But the question is, film courage. Do you have the courage? Do you have the courage to go there?
Do you have the courage to do that? What do you tell your students who are afraid their ideas will be stolen? So that is obviously a great question. It's obviously something people worry about. Um, so first of all, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give legal advice. So if someone's really concerned about this, you should talk to an entertainment attorney. So I'll just tell you what some of my understandings are. I'm not an attorney. Um, don't do any of this without checking with an attorney. Um, so you can copyright your scripts by well, you can actually literally just mail a copy to yourself and, and keep it sealed up and that will prove that you wrote that script on that date. Or you can uh, register it with the WGA, that's not too much money. So what you're doing is you're, you're, you have a record of, I wrote this script on this date. Okay. Now, again, I'm not an attorney, but I have taken law classes and it is my understanding that you can not copyright a concept. You cannot copyright an idea. You can only copyright uh, the execution. So if I have uh, an idea uh, about a guy who's in rate economic distress and he cooks crystal meth and he partners up with a student and I write this script, you know, Breaking Bad doesn't exist and I copyright it through the Writers Guild or however I do it um, and then someone else and I can prove they saw my script and they do it and it's the same concept, I don't believe I have any legal restitution at that point, unless they stole my execution. I mean, they took my characters, the exact situation. I mean, and this is now where court battles will be like, because there's a, a French term that I'm not gonna try to pronounce, but it basically says, if you had a concept and I had the same concept and we both, without knowing what each other were doing, wrote scripts, There'd be some things in common, just certain things kind of naturally fall from the concept. And there's a French word for that. And so it has to go beyond that. So like if you're going to sue me and, and you can prove I read your script um, and I said, well, yeah, I had the same idea and these sort of big ideas are kind of like anyone would come up with that. And you're like, yeah, but not this subplot, not this line of dialogue, not, you know, and you're gonna start pointing to specifics. Okay, and that's when the lawyers get involved. Um, so just to be clear, you can't, I don't believe, protect your concepts. Now, that makes writers say, well, then I don't want to show my script to anyone. Oh, and it's even worse than that. If you don't have an agent and you want someone to read your script, they're going to make you sign a document that says you're not going to sue them. And that's when writers go, oh, oh, no way am I doing that. Well, you don't have to. But then you know what? No one's going to read your scripts. And here's why. Nobody likes to be sued. And this is what happens. Um, I, I remember uh, when Barry came out uh, in different classes, I heard from six different writers saying, they stole that from me. I had an idea about a hitman that becomes an actor. You know what? A thousand people had that idea. They didn't steal it from anyone. Like, I remember so there was a talking dog movie and someone was like, I had that idea. Yet yeah, you and everyone. Like, so, but the thing is, is if you're the head of a studio, you're an agent or a manager, you don't want to read someone's script and then that means you can't do anything similar to that because you're going to be sued. I mean, if that's the case, they're not going to read your script. So the cost of getting someone to read your script is you got to sign something saying you're not going to sue them. Okay, well, why would you want to do that? Because you need people to read your script. Here's what a manager told me and I'll pass it on to you. He said, if you really want to, look, you can't really protect anything, really. But here's the best you can do. Learn how to write an amazing script. No one steals from an amazing writer. They steal from subpar writers. Here's why. If you have a great concept and you have a great execution, they are, this is Christmas morning for them because they can buy it, hire you to rewrite, and you don't cost very much money because you're a new writer. Now, if they steal your idea, and go hire a big time writer, it's gonna cost them millions of dollars. Now, if they think the concept's great and the execution's terrible and they're on the shadier side, could they steal that concept and go hire a writer? Probably. Would you have legal recourse? You have to talk to a lawyer, but I think you may not be excited by what you hear. So what the manager said is they only steal from bad scripts bad writers, great concepts. And in my experience, and I know a lot of executives, a lot of writers, a lot of people in the industry, 
I think stealing goes on a lot less than people think. I think if you hang around writers, you're gonna hear all these stories because everyone thinks their ideas were stolen. So um, it happens. It doesn't happen that often. It happens. But you know what? That risk is the ticket to the dance. And the, it's all the more reason to do everything you can to be a great writer. Do you believe all writers should outline? Absolutely not. Uh, I remember that now I was in a more ornery state when I was, I was a little angrier when I was younger, but when I first started writing and had success, uh, I was invited on a panel and there were different uh, teachers. And each teacher got up and said, you got to outline. And, and there's two kinds of writers. There's writers that outline and then there's writers that fail. And you know, if you don't know where you're going, you're never gonna get there. And if you just dive in and start writing, you're just gonna get lost and you have to outline. Now again, I just wanna uh, put a caveat. I was younger and angrier. So it was my turn, I was the last person. And I, I said, hi, I'm Corey Mandel. I sold Metropolis to Ridley Scott. Uh, he's making the movie, because at that time he was making the movie, it ultimately didn't happen, but anyway, at that time he's making the movie, and I just sold uh, two more scripts, one to Warner Brothers and one to Paramount. I didn't outline any of those, and I sat down. So one of the teachers took the bait, and they're like, well, well, I mean, I guess it depends on what you're writing, you know, there's like, if you're doing like a, you know, but you know, if you're doing like a, a, a structure, and I interrupted, I said, well, one script is a thriller, and one is a science fiction, and the other is a very complex plotted script. And I sat down, and then they just went, well, you know, maybe there's always an exception to every rule. And then of course I couldn't let that go. And I said, or there are no rules. And then it devolved from there. So now, I didn't outline. For me to say, so you shouldn't outline, is, is incredibly stupid. It goes back to process. You gotta find what works for you. I know writers who are incredibly successful who outline. I know writers who are extremely successful who don't outline. So what I would say is, um, if you always wanna outline and you feel like you'd be lost if you didn't outline, you should learn a process where you don't outline to see where that takes you. Usually, you're gonna do your best work. Not necessarily always, but you should try that. If you're someone that just likes to wing it, and you're like, if I have an outline, I don't even wanna write it. Like, to me, it's all about the joy of the discovery. You should outline before you write, to try it. Not, not for the rest of your, to try it. It's, it's really frustrating because, you know, writing is a creative, well, it should be a creative pursuit. And like, when you're around young kids uh, before they get damaged, like, they play with such innocence and joy and spontaneity. And they don't live in a world of shoulds. They don't live in a world of rules. They just live in a world of, I'm a pirate and you're this, you're this, I'm on that. And just, it's just spontaneous and it, that is so human and so captivating. Yeah, they're, they're, their stories are simple because they're young children, but they're, they're full of joy and authenticity. And then we just get damaged as we grow up and we get these negative messages and we get criticized and we, and we start being told what we should do and what we have to do and what the rules are. And if you don't follow the rules, ooh, you're in trouble. And that just kills creativity. So your process, explore it open-heartedly. And the other thing I'll say about outlining um, and um, just because I know we're, we're almost out of time, so I can't go into too much detail, but there'll be a lot more information on this on my website if you want to check it out, coriamandel.net. A really big thing that I do with my writers is story design. And the best writers rarely outline. Now, they might story design before they write, or they may write and do story design, but story designing is very different from outlining, and I think a lot of writers, if they can find a way to escape the, the, the outline prison. They're gonna feel liberated, they're gonna suddenly love writing a lot more, and they're gonna be much more successful. So let me, uh, let me just define the difference between story design and outline. Here's what an outline is. You're figuring out the events, what's gonna happen in your script. This is gonna happen, and this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, and ooh, that's gonna happen. So you're figuring out the events and the chronology of the events. That's not what the best writers do. They don't start with the events. They don't start with the order of the events. What they start with is their objectives. 
What is their objective? What are they trying to get people to experience and why? And that's called an experience map. You actually map out the experiences you want people to have throughout this journey. Then, and only then, you find the events that create those experiences. And then you figure out how to make those events compelling. It's complete opposite how most people do it. So most people, just you know, like me who went through film school, we again were taught, have a bunch of compelling events and find the order of it. That is so rigid and limiting, and it doesn't usually add up to anything. And it was just a mind blower for me when I worked with Ridley Scott or Milos Forman or got to hang out with Quentin Tarantino. And I know I sound like I'm dropping names. I'm not, I'm not saying any of these people are my friends. Uh, I either worked for them or I met them in parties and I talked to them. So I'm not trying to do that LA thing of like, oh yeah, I'm friends with all these people. Um, but one of the really cool things about launching my career early on in Ridley Scott, um, saying he was gonna make the movie, is I was the big hot writer for eight months. And so I got invited to all the cool parties. That was great. And um, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer nerd, I'm a story nerd. So, oh, Harrison Ford's there and you know, um, Sharon Stone or you know Kathleen Turner or whatever. I'm not. I'm really dating myself. No. Anyway, but these stars are there, and I'm like, okay, the Coen Brothers or Quentin Tarantino, and I would just go hang out there and want to talk about writing. It was a real revelation to me how they work because I was always trying to understand other people's process to try to improve mine because I I knew I had a flawed process as a writer. I was doing the best I could with a flawed process. So it's like I was a golfer. I didn't have good mechanics in my swing and I had to do a lot of things to compensate for it, but I really wanted to improve my swing, so to speak. So yeah, they, they don't outline. They don't figure out the events. They figure out the experience they want you to have. Then they find the event that creates that experience. Then they make that event compelling. And I'll tell you, if you try that and you learn how to do it, You'll never go back to outlining and you will say, why wasn't I doing this from the very beginning? Now, after you've done that design, it will create an outline. So the outline will actually be the result of the design. It won't be what creates the design. And I know that you, anyone listening to this who's at all interested in writing probably has a million questions. Uh, this is an hour conversation, but I segued into it. You can go to my website, coreymandel.net just to bring it all home. If you're outlining or doing story design, however you do it, there are very successful writers who do it up front. There are very su successful writers who write a bunch of drafts to find it and then do it. You have to do it at some point. And please don't listen to anyone that tells you when you should do it or how you should do it because process is figuring out through exploration which way allows you to create your best stories and your best characters.